Yes, yes, it, it's done it. Okay. Yes. There we are. That, well, that's great. That solves all the problem. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Okay, everybody. Well, welcome to uh, the Existentialist Society's Agnostics Group. I'm David Miller. I'm the convener. And today's speaker is Rick Marshall from Seattle in the USA, in case um, <laughs> you don't realize it. What time is it there, by the way, Rick? It's uh, 8.40 at night. Right. So we're, we're Saturday, uh, 2.40 uh, p.m. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So Rick's topic is the philosophy uh, of Kenneth Smith. And after he's uh, finished his presentation, we'll throw it open to, uh, to Rick and the cat to, uh, <laughs> for questions, comments by you and discussion. Okay, Rick, it's all yours. Thanks. Yeah, I, I figure we'll, uh, I'll start with a short presentation, just kind of introducing who Kenneth Smith is and some background about him. And then uh, when it comes to time to talk about the meat of his philosophy, we'll, um, We'll, we'll make that more of an interactive dialogue because um, that's what he would do. So I'll start by sharing my screen. Oh, host disabled participant screen oh, sharing. Oh, okay. Yes. Whoop, whoop. Allow participants to share screen. Okay. All right, let's try again. Yep, here we go. So we'll share and we have, hey, look, it's a presentation. We'll, uh, Enter full screen so we can do this correctly. So <clears throat> thank you for this opportunity to do this presentation. I've never done anything like this, trying to summarize Kenneth Smith's work before. When I called him up and told him I was doing this, we both had a good laugh about it. Uh, <laughs> he's, uh, he's all over the place. Uh, he, he covers a lot of ground. Uh, and uh, as an example, we just finished, I have a group that meets on Mondays and uh, we've been meeting once a week since last year. Uh, we went 37 weeks uh, covering one of his books. Uh, so it's, uh, it's an enormous amount of material. So I'm, for now, I'm just gonna focus on sort of an introduction and overview. Uh, see if, uh, if, that's, if that's enough to, to get us going. And then the bulk of the time I think will be free for us to then you know, talk about selected topics, whatever people are interested in. And uh, I, can, I can catalyze it if, if people uh, are hesitant to get started. So since, because this is the Existentialist Society's uh, agnostics group, I, I thought people would appreciate uh, this, 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 this particular little parable by, by uh, Kenneth Smith from his book, Minotaur. Uh, which is which is in preparation, not yet published. There are only two kinds of philosophy, just as there are of religion, existentialist and escapist. Uh, Kenneth Smith calls himself an existentialist philosopher. Um, he's very interested in how things actually are, uh, rather than how we wish they might be, or what kind of systems we would like to impose upon the world. Uh, he's he's uh, he tries to do it the other way around. And uh, the at the bottom is a is a bit of um, Heraclitus, just as a as a just for a taste. And uh, Philip Wheelwright translates that as um, lovers, lovers of wisdom have to acquaint themselves with a great many facts. Uh, and uh, I thought that was a pretty good, a great many details. And I thought that was a pretty good one for, for Kenneth. He is very widely read. Um, he, he brings a lot of other philosophers into his work uh, and, uh, and sort of has a voracious appetite. We'll, we'll, we'll get more into that, but... Uh, but that bit of that bit of Heraclitus seemed to be appropriate. So um, let's just move on to the next screen. The first thing to know about Kenneth Smith's philosophy is that he's not so much a philosophy professor, although he did that for a while professionally. He's not so much a philosophy writer, um, although he writes a tremendous amount. But he doesn't make a living writing philosophy. Um, he's not a philosophy academic. His, his, his focus is not on cataloging what other philosophers have said, uh, but he voraciously reads other philosophers' work. He's trying to actually be a philosopher per se, to actually philosophize. And as part of that, he wants to participate in the long conversation over the millennia with all the people who've, who've wrestled with these issues. So interspersed throughout this presentation, um, I have little slides, including some of his influences, some of the people uh, with, with, with uh, various little quotes like this one here. Um, and um, 
And part of the reason I do that is that his approach to philosophy is, is it largely involves a frequent references to other philosophers and bringing their body of work into the middle of sentences and arguments. Uh, so, you, you know, any, any quotes like the ones you're going to see here are going to crop up when you're reading Kenneth Smith's work uh, on a regular basis. Um, in particular, I'm struck by the quote from The Human Condition. More people, I think, are familiar with Eichmann in Jerusalem, but in The Human Condition, she really examines the problem that we've got ourselves to a stage of history where we're able to do things that we don't have any language or intuition for. Uh, we don't know how to say it. We don't know how to think it. Uh, we often are, are, are reduced to using mathematical models that are not intuitive in any way. If you do the math, it comes out correctly. But if you're trying to explain in a coherent, intuitive way to somebody what it, what it is that it means, uh, we often can't. Uh, and uh, she uses that as a, as a metaphor to go beyond science and talk about you know, what is it that we're doing in the world? And what is it that we're doing with ourselves in the ways that we architect society? And these are themes that Kenneth Smith picked up and ran with. Uh, he definitely sees you know, Hannah Arendt as, as part of his, his lineage. So overall, uh, the presentation is, is mainly going to focus on introducing him, on giving him a little capsule bio, um, mentioning I'm not even going to try to cover all of his influences, the long list of influences. I'm also not going to try to cover the medium list of influences. I'm just going to try to cover the short list of influences. And I, I called him up two days ago, and, and we chatted for a couple of hours while we kind of massaged the list to, see if, to make sure I wasn't missing some things, and I was, so it, it'll be a better list now. Uh, I have a two-part bibliography that'll include what's been published so far, but we'll also talk about the many, many, many books he has in progress uh, that are that are part way done, some of which are on my laptop and some of which are on his computer and so forth. Uh, we'll, we'll, go a, we'll do a quick run through um, some of the papers that he's published, just as a way to sort of see the sort of topics he's interested in and that he wrestles with. And, and then finally, um, you know, we'll, we'll open up the discussion to, to selected topics uh, within, within the body of the philosophy as a whole. Uh, Kenneth Smith is a Hellenophile. Uh, he picks up from the tradition of, of uh, folks who uh, really see the Greeks as foundational uh, to modern philosophy. If there were two main areas of, of interest he has, one would be the Greeks and the other would be the 19th century Germans. Uh, he was when he was young, he was drawn to the, the philosophers that other people thought were difficult. Those were the people he wanted to wrestle with, he wanted to learn from. Uh, and he's, he's really built his philosoph philosophical system out of that. Um, we're gonna talk a bit about the Greeks and the, and the way that uh, Kenneth Smith sort of sees them and, and works them into his philosophy. Um, but um, this kind of appeal to principles uh, to appeal to nature, trying to figure out what the natural order of things is, and, and aligning the philosophy with that, that you, that you find in Aristotle and Heraclitus and others is, is, uh, is pretty basic to, to, to Kenneth Smith's work. Um, and all of these quotes you're seeing here are things that he's brought up many times uh, in his own work. So yeah, in a nutshell, um, he's a culture critic. Uh, that can be really uncomfortable for people. He critiques modernism which people aren't used to. Modern, modernism is used to flattering itself. The modern world believes it's the best and brightest. It's the most objective. We see things truer than, than anybody's ever seen them. We believe we have more human rights than anybody ever had. We care more about rights. We think we're more enlightened, more advanced, that we live longer, that we just sort of, there almost isn't any area of human endeavor where we don't pat ourselves on the head. Uh, modernism is sort of an era that just relentlessly flatters itself. And that's the water we swim in. That's as, as modern fishies, we swim through that water, we take it for granted, we're used to um, an extremely high dose of flattery uh, for just for being moderns. And so for Kenneth, like Nietzsche and some other predecessors to go after modernism and critique it, uh, and critique it not sort of viciously, but certainly ferociously because he anatomizes it and looks at kind of what is it as a phase of history what are its pros and cons? And, and we usually don't like to hear the cons very much. Uh, he, uh, he wrote, among other things, he wrote columns for the Comics Journal. He, he got a little uh, space in the back because the, the publisher was a friend of his. And in the back, he would write philosophical essays about a variety of topics. And over the years that he wrote for the Comics Journal, they received more hate mail 
about his philosophical column than about every other subject put together. Uh, and it was almost all from intelligent people because in modernism, intelligent people are used to being the smartest person in the room. They really don't like being confronted by somebody who is very well educated on these subjects and who sees sort of what our hypocrisies are and our peccadilloes and so forth. Uh, that was actually how I discovered Kenneth Smith. Uh, I was, uh, I, I found him through the comics journal. I was amused at the, at the, at the, at the, at the savagery of the response against him. And, uh, and uh, you know, people said he was using his vocabulary uh, 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 you know, to intimidate, you know, uh, gratuitously. And so I ran an exercise. I took one of his columns and tried to rewrite it using simple language. Uh, and, um, you know, it was like 10 times as long. Uh, what I discovered is that he wasn't using any of that stunning vocabulary gratuitously. It was all very precise, very diagnostic. And, and what that told me is that it was just really intimidating people. So the thing about Kenneth Smith's writing is that, um, in order to develop the precise vocabulary that he needs to talk about the subjects the way that he does, uh, he's, he's using words in ways that we're not accustomed to. Uh, and it means that um, when you first read Kenneth Smith, you're gonna misread most of it because you're gonna bring your own interpretation of the words and the, and the concepts to bear. And it's only upon returning to the same essay over time that you gradually begin to figure out, you know, how he's using his language, what he's trying to talk about. And, and frequently is something that you might have read as a personal attack or personal criticism might turn out to be nothing of the sort. He might be talking about the sorts of things that we wrestle with as moderns and, and there, there are challenges that we have to overcome. You, you sort of don't know until you, you get the language into focus. So that's one of the things about what we're going to see uh, when, we, when we look at his work. Uh, he is an artist, uh, painter, and draftsman. He he wrote, um, he did a lot of fantasy and science fiction art covers in the 60s and 70s. He's illustrated for children's books. He's made a set of philosophical comic books, uh, and he illustrates some of his own books as well. So uh, for a while, he worked on ad campaigns for, you know, major businesses. Uh, so there's, he's got that side of him. Uh, he writes an enormous amount but only a small fraction of it ends up being published. Uh, most of it he writes to email lists or, or in, in you know, private discussions or in drafts for books that he, he may or may not you know, decide to continue to do or he might, he might set it aside. Uh, he is a retired professor. He worked for a while at um, LSU uh, and, uh, and then at University of Texas. Um, but in the end, uh, he decided that he needed to be free of the academic environment. He became a critic of, of academia and the ways that it, it gets turned into a sort of self-serving ecosystem. Uh, and, uh, and so he left that behind. And now pretty much since then, aside from selling books and, and doing commissioned art, uh, he's, he's pretty much uh, you know, basically an independent philosopher. That's, that's sort of the life that he lives. So um, when you read Kenneth Smith's work, what you're gonna find is, is an enormous number of references to philosophers, um, to sociologists, uh, to writers on politics or economics. You're gonna find Dostoevsky or, or Yeats or Tolstoy or Auden, Kafka. You're gonna find a lot of references. And the purpose of the references is, is condensing his argument, right? So if Kierkegaard has already covered the ground very well that he wants to talk about, he's just gonna import a reference to Kierkegaard and talk about you know, either or and, and the passage he's concerned about and move on. And so part of what that means is that, you know, the more widely read you are in philosophy, the more you get out of reading Kenneth Smith. Um, and if you're not as widely read in philosophy, Kenneth Smith can function like a syllabus for a self-study philosophy class, as he's constantly mentioning these references that, that someone should, should pick up and should investigate. Uh, so that's something about what it feels like to, to read him. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that more in a bit. A discussion that we've had in our, in our uh, Monday seminars is that um, he's not a systematizer. He's not as chaotic as, as, as Nietzsche, although he certainly read and digested Nietzsche and Nietzsche is an influence on his style. But he's not a systematizer because he finds the development of philosophical systems to largely be escapist. It's usually appealing to kind of noetic, rationalizing, intellectualizing approaches where we sort of lay out a recipe for how we think the world ought to work. 
and then attempt to pound it into place, you know, the man with the hammer problem, the Procrustean bed. Uh, so he's more, his, his approach to being an existentialist philosopher means he's, he'd rather tackle the issues directly and then bring to bear whatever philosophical perspectives seem to be useful or helpful. Uh, likewise, he's not pushing a single philosophical perspective. What he used to do in his philosophy classes at the university was um, they would have a topic on the floor and um, you know, people could bring up a, you know, a pair of philosophers who, were, who had wildly divergent opinions and he'd role play them for the class. It's like, okay, let's have Kant and Nietzsche get into an argument about the subject of free will and see what happens. And so his interest is, in, is not in sitting back as an abstract judge and pounding all the philosophers into his system to show who's good and who's bad. His interest is in what actually are in their own terms, from their own perspectives, what are the different takes of these different philosophers? How do they see the world differently from each other? And what can we learn not only from by comparing and contrasting the differences, but also from that ability to, as he puts it, dislocate the joint of the mind and be able to drop it into a different socket and turn it around to look at ourselves and look at what's happening when we try to impose an ideology or a worldview upon the, upon the world. The exercise of hopping between different perspectives you know, strengthens our, our agility mentally and philosophically and opens us up to the possibility that, um, that there's more to learn, that there's more to see, uh, that, um, that it, it's, it's a way to tame the hubris that normally comes along with being a smart person. You know, if you're, if you're a smart person, you're used to being surrounded by people who aren't as smart as you are, you're used to sort of having this impression that uh, you more or less have a grasp on things. And of course, for a finite mortal, that's a dangerous game to play, living in an infinite universe full of possibilities. So that exercise of being able to hop perspectives is very good for disciplining uh, the hubris and getting it under control. So as part of that, he talks about differences, not just between individual philosophers, but differences between epochs of history and how, for example, the medieval mind conceived of nature versus how a modern conceives of nature versus how an ancient conceives of nature. What, what, how are their worldviews constructed? What's the anatomy and physiology of them? Why do they see things differently? And by doing that, again, we not only get insight into those past eras, but we get insight into our own era because we learn how to see it from the outside and see which things that we're used to taking for granted are actually pretty peculiar and, and distinctive of us, which things that we think of our objectivity might actually be our own subjective experience as moderns. Um, and so out of this, he doesn't propose any kind of utopian solutions. He doesn't say, this is, this is how you should live, or this is how the world ought to work. Uh, you know, he's not a Marxist. He's not a, he's not a, he's not an anythingist. He's a, he's a, he's a critic of ideologies. Uh, and, uh, and their limitations. And so uh, what he's mainly trying to demonstrate is that there are more possibilities available to us than we typically think. As moderns, we're, we're sort of trained to think that the way we see the world is more or less accurate, more or less right, more or less objective. And by doing that, by, by getting trapped within that sort of labyrinth of perspectives, it, it can create a certain kind of passivity and fatalism in us. So that if we, if we don't see how to solve something from a modern perspective, we think it can't be solved. Uh, you'll sometimes see uh, in the ecological communities, you'll see people say, well, you know, moderns have trashed the ecosystems around the world. So that must just be human nature. It must be that people trash the world wherever they go and that people have always been this way and this is the only option. Uh, and it's, it's part of where you see a certain kind of, um, you know, eco-fatalism that comes about sometimes where people say the best thing for the world would be if people went extinct. But of course, the problem with that is it's taking for granted modernism's proposition that the modern human is the normal human or the default human or the, or the sum total of what a human being can be. And so part of what happens through this process that Kenneth Smith takes us through is opening up our understanding that modernism is only one option. There are a lot of other options. We can't even imagine what they all are, but just by getting to see a few others that are fundamentally different, we can break free from the trap of thinking that we're stuck. That, we're, that, 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 that there's no way out. And we can start to see that there are future possibilities. He doesn't try to tell us what they are. He, has, you know, he says, as a modern, he's, a, he's, he's got the same myopia the rest of us has. 
But what he can do is point the way to say there are ways out of the labyrinth. And when we get out there, you know, more power to us. Maybe we can figure out, you know, what we ought to do next. The main thing to take away, you know, when you when you read his text, the main thing to bring to it to understand is that he's got a sense of humor. He, it, when you talk to him on the phone or in a lecture, he's laughing all the time. He's a, he's a really funny guy. He's got a lively mind. He's very interested and curious. Uh, he has a sense of mischief. Uh, he likes he likes irony. Uh, he likes uh, he likes gotchas. When he was a teenager, he liked to surprise his teachers with little logic bombs. Uh, you know, he'd sort of watch them and study them and see what the limits were of their thinking, and then try to throw them little puzzles uh, that would trip them up. And uh, and so there's a playfulness when you when you read his work uh, if you if you're if you're reading it in the spirit that uh, uh, that he brought to it. So this is my little capsule introduction. Um, and just for a break again, hello, Goethe. Uh, you know, um, Goethe is an influence. Goethe uh, talked a bit about um, the, the difference between uh, the creative experiential side of the mind and the rigorous analytical rational side of the mind and the way that those see the world fundamentally differently and both operate within us. You know, Faust, among other things, is, a, is, a, is an exploration of that topic because of Faust's bargain with Mephistopheles, claiming that he could live an entirely distanced, abstracted life in which he doesn't get attached to anything. And that's the bet he makes. Uh, and in that, Goethe is exploring what it means to be a modern. And so this is a major issue uh, that, that, uh, that Kenneth Smith works on. Uh, and he comes back to Goethe regularly. All right, capsule bio. Uh, he went to University of Texas. He was, the, you know, University of Texas was a land grant university. Uh, at the time, they were they had a flood of money because of the petroleum industry, uh, and so they were sort of buying up talent as fast as they could. You could sort of imagine the sports team equivalent of now we've got money, let's go get some, let's go get some uh, hot shot athletes. That's what was happening in all the departments. John Silver uh, was um, head of the philosophy department, and he was on the hunt for people that you know, he could train up to be philosophy hotshots. And uh, he snagged Kenneth Smith. Kenneth Smith started out, he was gonna be a sociologist. When he was younger, he was reading C. Wright Mills and Max Weber and, and Tonys and others. And, uh, and, and, and Silver caught him and said, I think you should be a philosopher instead uh, and, uh, and dragged him into the philosophy department. And, uh, and so that's kind of when the, when the big switch happened for Kenneth. It's part of why his approach to philosophy is so different. He didn't start out in sort of the pure left brain, logical, analytical, academic approach. He started out in the sort of pugnacious culture criticism side of sociology and sociologists of the, of the mid 20th century and, uh, and then brought that with him into philosophy, uh, which, is, which is what makes his approach so unusual. Um, you can see here when he was teaching at uh, Louisiana State University at Baton Rouge and when he was teaching at University of Dallas, um, the fact that he wrote for Comics Journal, he wrote the, the essays that he wrote for the Comics Journal were philosophical essays. They really had very little to do with comics. They're pretty much entirely about philosophy. And um, pretty much since then, it's, it's been uh, independent scholarship. That's what he's been doing. Uh, a couple of us, David Roel and some others, were on his uh, philosophical email list from 2003 to 2018. And what he would do during that time is people would pitch him newspaper articles of things that are happening in current events. And then he'd write philosophical essays about them just ad hoc on the fly. Uh, and uh, it created an enormous body of material uh, that uh, some of which will someday end up in books and some of which probably never will. Of course, I married an editor and I care about editing. So of course it's right now as I'm doing the presentation that I see my typo about his writing and publishing. So hooray, uh, there's, a, there's the cure for hubris, right? And uh, his house, I've, I've been to his house once. When I say he's widely read, I guess what I want to convey is imagine, you know, what it's like when you're wandering through the stacks in a, in a, um, in a library and cross that with kind of the look and feel of a bookstore, one of those old used bookstores. And now picture that being your living room, one of your bedrooms, two or three of the other main rooms in the house, and the places where you live are sort of squeezed in around the edges of that. That's that's what it's like at his place. It's 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 uh, you wander through a maze of of bookshelves and books and papers and and artworks uh, on your way to the bathroom or the kitchen or wherever you're going. Uh, it's pretty funny. All right, 
Hegel, uh, as, as, as one of the more difficult 19th century philosophers, Hegel's one of the touchstones uh, for Kenneth Smith, uh, particularly his existentialism more than his idealism. Uh, so, you know, the fact that the way we approach problems should be driven by nature and our understanding of the lawfulness of nature. Uh, you know, the way that, um, for example, you know, Hegel despised the use of the terms thesis, antithesis, synthesis for describing his dialectics. He preferred to talk about the bud, the blossom, and the fruit because he wanted to emphasize that you're not just picking two arbitrary topics and pitting them against each other and creating a synthesis out of them, but rather any one thing in nature is always in a process of transformation and change, becoming something new. And that new thing that's, that's becoming out of it goes through a process of negation and struggle against it to emerge. Uh, and you know what, what, um, what later writers have tried to sum up as synthesis, he describes as the process by which these things become reconciled into a new third stage of development. This kind of idea of nature as the driver becoming in transformation as the driver is, is pretty central uh, to Kenneth Smith's work. He's, um, you know, Hegel wrote that there wasn't a single proposition of the Greek philosopher Heraclitus's that he didn't incorporate into, he into his own philosophy, into Hegel's own philosophy. And in many ways, that's true about the relationship between Kenneth Smith and Hegel. Uh, Kenneth Smith is not strictly a Hegelian. He draws from a lot more sources than that, but pretty much, pretty much all of Hegel has been digested and, and pulled into the work that he does. Um, so moving along. So this is a short list of influences. Uh, and um, I'm really, it's probably not complete if I'm just trying to do justice to the very shortest list of the main influences upon him. But it gets some of the highlights. And what you see is, you know, between Arendt, and Hegel and Kierkegaard and Nietzsche and Marx, um, among others, there is a strong existentialist tradition being drawn off of here. And you see that as well with Heraclitus and Aristotle, who really stood um, on the opposite end of the pole from Plato and Parmenides when it came to a focus on how nature actually is rather than based on the abstract intellectual schemas that we might try to apply to it. Um, you see a lot of sociologists on this list. Uh, Carla C. Wright Mills uh, is here. Um, Max Weber is here. You know Paul Paul Weiss and others. This this kind of focus on um, you know critiquing society on having philosophy not be in a silo or in an ivory tower, but having it actually engage with the issues of the day, uh, uh, taking risks, uh, being willing to be wrong. Uh, you know not tying yourself to an endless series of footnotes to try to prove that you should be allowed to write, but instead to master the material well enough that you're comfortable with it and confident with it internally, and then writing original material, just citing your references where you need to, but just really charging ahead. That, that's, that's what he brings by the marriage of those two things. Um, I mentioned John Silber on here because he really built the department that originally got Kenneth brought in. But John Silber's philosophy and his later life course in politics are very different from um, uh, very different from Kenneth Smith's. Paul Weiss uh, was one of the young Turks uh, being brought into um, being brought into the department that John Silber was was building, and uh, and and he brought the love of philosophy, the love of the love of debate and 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 polemics and discussion. Um, Kenneth Smith took classes from William Arrowsmith, uh, for example, who, who you know, people may know as a, as a translator of, of um, you know, Aristophanes and, and other Greeks. Um, you know, he, he took classes from Gilbert Murray. Uh, Paul Weiss, in particular, um, I cite here because uh, he, you can find him, his work on, uh, on Amazon and elsewhere. He's, he's written on a wide variety of subjects like the philosophy of sports. Uh, but the thing that he was famous for as a lecturer at UT at the time was uh, was his Hegel. His Hegel classes were outstanding. And of all the things that he wrote about, he never actually converted any of that into a book, uh, which is which is a crime because he, he just had a lucid penetrating perspective. Uh, so Kenneth Smith sort of takes that with him and, and tries to include that in the way he talks about things. 
what else can I say about these this list? Um, obviously, you know, Walter Kaufman opened up Nietzsche to the world with his with his new generation of translations in the 50s, 60s, and early 70s. And so he plays a critical role in our in our understanding, you know, Nietzsche's relationship to Hegel and others. Um, but I think generally speaking, you know, we can come back to this if people have questions about it, but otherwise uh, we'll, uh, we'll let it go. Heraclitus is a, is a central theme for, uh, you know, a touchstone for, uh, uh, for Kenneth Smith. Uh, he, he, you know, he seized on Heraclitus's work early on uh, and was particularly interested you know, not in the attempt to pigeonhole Heraclitus into some kind of um, uh, early philosopher focusing on what things are made of. You see a lot of coverage of Heraclitus talks about, well, Thales said water and Heraclitus says fire. But, but of course that completely misses the point. The, the, what's interesting about Heraclitus is his focus on becoming as the natural order of things, as, as, the, as, the, as, as the way nature works. Cutting, you know, he solves the problem of the, the excluded, the excluded middle between being and non-being by, by focusing on transformation and, and the lawfulness of the transformation, the way that everything that exists carries within it the seeds of the future, and that everything is, in, is not just what it is, but it's also in the process of becoming something new, reconciling its own dialectics to, 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 for, so that something new can emerge. And that Heraclitus, although it's, it's, not, it's not as widely appreciated as it should be, that Heraclitus applies this same dialectics of nature and natural order, not just to the external world, but to the internal world, where he talks about the nature of human character and human thought. How is it that people get lost in their ideologies and, and preferences and, and, and lose track of the world? Uh, how is it that people can look directly at the world and not see it for what it is. What is happening in us? What is the what is the lawful nature within us that makes it possible for us to be so wrong about the things that we're looking directly at? Uh, it's um, it's pretty profound stuff. And and in the same way that Hegel unpacks it uh, into into Hegel's dialectics and philosophy, Kenneth Smith continues that unpacking process and applies it in, in other ways as well. So here's a bibliography of of some of his works. Some of these are di the dialectical conceptions of spirit was his doctorate, uh, studies in nihilism and ideology, and otherwise and webs are books. Uh, most of the rest of this is uh, is columns that he did uh, for um, for the comics journal. Phantasmagoria was his philosophical comic book, and uh, of course he's an artist, so he's got one portfolio published and another one he's working on right now. Um, you'll see that uh, there was a break in the publishing at around 2010 with the Cave of False Consciousness. Uh, and since then, uh, he's been working on so many things at the same time that none of them has been finished. They're, they're all, it's like a dozen or more books are all sort of in process partway through being done. Um, and as a result, I'm going to come back to Kierkegaard in a moment. It means that you know, in preparation is a very long, a very long list of books, many of which, you know, are, are, are first draft or already second draft, but still need a lot more work before they're going to be done. Uh, and um, some of these are, are things that um, David and I are helping with, David Roel and I are helping with, and uh, other, other things are things that he's, he's sort of doing on his own. Old World Principles, the first one on the list, is going to be a book that collects um, all of his philosophical papers that he's written for various uh, philosophical societies. Uh, and we'll uh, we'll take a look at those titles in a little bit. But um, but going back to this list, uh, what you'll find is he's like Nietzsche. He's he's sort of torn between the long form and the short form. He writes most of the time in the long form, uh, but he he wants you know he he admires uh, the the art of condensation, uh, the bon mot, uh, and uh, you know so. In otherwise in webs, he tried writing in a more concentrated form, where it's a large number of very small sections, uh, and uh, he continues that uh, with uh, with Minotaur, uh, which is which is being developed right now. So um, in tonight's class, I say class. In tonight's seminar, uh, we'll you know we'll have available. I have a selection of of parables, paradigms, and paradoxes drawn from otherwise webs and from Minotaur. Um, I I haven't brought out any of his long form work for us to talk about because. You know, time is so pressing, and we're not gonna we're not gonna have time to to really to really wrestle with with his long stuff. But we can talk about it. Um, these other works around it: dramas of the mind, millennia and microcosm, 
uh, crypto revolution of our age, human natures and cave of false consciousness. Those are more long form. They're, they're written in chapters, but they make, you know, single, very long extended arguments. Um, so for example, dramas of the mind is sort of a philosophical introductory uh, uh, set of chapters. Uh, millennia in microcosm is an attempt to talk through the uh, history of philosophy, or the philosophy of history. Uh, it talks through his, his take on the modern epoch, the medieval epoch, and the ancient epoch, how they compare and contrast, how to typify them, and, and, and you know, what they can say about each other, what they can illuminate about each other. Crypto revolution of our age uh, is talking about the way that, especially in the United States, but, but also in, in other places, uh, th during the 90s, um, there was a massive sort of incremental coup d'etat to overthrow sort of a human rights-based approach to governance as society and replace it with a more authoritarian uh, approach. And uh, in it, he, he explores politics and kind of how did, how did that happen? How do we not even notice it? Why is it not being talked about in the newspapers and so forth? Human Natures is a series that talks about human psychology uh, based on the different modes of thought uh, that people have and how that, how that manifests into life preferences. Uh, and so forth. So that gives you some sense of some of the sorts of things that he writes about. Um, you know, he does at times zero in on specific philosophers and spend more time with them and, and their work and trying to get it to be, to be understood, but um, he covers a lot of ground. Kierkegaard, uh, another favorite of, of, of um, Kenneth Smith's. Pardon while I drink there. Kierkegaard's a can be a difficult philosopher because he spends so much time writing from the perspective of one or another character who represents a worldview so that he can pit worldviews against each other. And um, he doesn't always signal <laughs> when, he's, when, he's, when is he speaking as Kierkegaard and when is he speaking as one of these fictional philosophical characters. But once you catch on to what he's doing, he really is trying to explore kind of key themes about kind of the nature of, of human psychology. How does it work? Why does it work the way that it does and how does that manifest itself in the world? Uh, it's, uh, it's fascinating material that Kenneth Smith draws off of in his work. So, and of course, Nietzsche, um, I think, you know, not, not, just the, not just the appreciation of the Hellenic, but the appreciation of, of what Nietzsche called the Dionysian or what, um, what the Greeks might've called the, the Gnosic or gnomic side, the creative experiential side of the human mind uh, and, uh, and how important it is and how if you attempt to over-rationalize everything and stamp out the creative side, uh, you end up with sort of a machine world that's not satisfying for everybody and a kind of machine life that's not satisfying. And how what we're striking, what we wanna do isn't even to achieve a balance per se, but what we wanna do is get to where we can use both basal faculties of the mind you know, at, at their full power, but in harmony with each other, helping each other, reinforcing each other. But these are themes that he explores a lot uh, in his work. And, and, a, and a lot of that draws out of Nietzsche, even though Nietzsche never explains it systematically, even though Nietzsche hops from one subject to another in his short form, uh, and even though Nietzsche changes his mind over time, so that in the beginning of his work, Apollo is the hero and Dionysus is the villain. But by the end of his work, he's come around to saying, actually, we can't suppress the Dionysian. We have to. We have to handle it. Uh, you know, this 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 material comes out uh, in Kenneth Smith's work. All right. So I'm not going to try to talk through all these papers. I'm just going to go through them slowly, uh, page a screen at a time, give people a chance to scan it, because you can just see from the titles kind of what are the sorts of materials that Kenneth Smith writes about. What what kind of material is he interested in? Um, and you know, you can see right off the bat the, the influence of sociology. You can see the way that um, he's exploring and critiquing nihilism, critiquing modernism, um, critiquing the promises of the market uh, versus what does it actually deliver. You can see um, the way that he talks about the structure of consciousness, uh, the structure of the human mind and subjectivity. Uh, you can see that he spends plenty of time on Kafka and Calvino and, and other creative types as well to try to see kind of what is the mythic side uh, that's often neglected by overly academic or overly intellectualized philosophers. What is the rest of the picture of the human experience and how do we bring that into the, into the mix properly? Um, 
you can see uh, from this, you know, one of the thing, one of the recurring themes in people who are trying to get used to Kenneth Smith's work is that like Nietzsche and Kierkegaard and, and some others, he is not like Hannah Arendt. He is not a friend, afraid to spend a very long time talking about um, and, and diagnosing and anatomizing really extremely disturbing features of the modern world. Things that, that the rest of us like try to brush past, try to change the subject after a certain amount because we, we can't handle that much negativity. But he's like, you have to understand how the negativity works. You have to understand why these problems develop the way they do, why the corruption comes out the way it does in order to have a chance to change any of it. Uh, so one of the things that's interesting in his work is the way that following up on Hegel, he will modulate between the relationship uh, from what are the different modes of thought that we've evolved to have versus what kinds of personalities or character types tend to develop out of those modes of thought if we use them out of balance versus what sorts of cultures or communities tend to develop out of large numbers of people who tend to you know, behave or, 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 or develop their character in that way versus you know, ages or epochs of history when certain kinds of cultures dominate. Uh, you know, he, he, does, he traces all the way through uh, the full anatomy and the relationships between them rather than treating psychology versus epistemology versus culture versus history as completely separate siloed subjects the way a lot of writers do. He, he weaves them together into an organic whole. Uh, so that's it for the for the body of work. Uh, we've we've talked about the papers. That, uh, we, you know, we, we we've mentioned the papers. We've talked about the books that have been published. We've talked about the books that haven't been published. And from here on out, other than taking a brief stop with you know essayist Paul Valery and his his incredible uh, his incredible writing uh, and, and insights into the modern order. Uh, at this point, we can break open uh, this 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 ends the. The kind of quick linear presentation part of the discussion. I have a lot of material of Kenneth Smith on hand uh, that we can go through and explore together, but I also want to give us a chance to, to have people ask questions uh, and or, or make comments or what have you. So why don't I pause here and see what people have to say. Okay, thank you, Rick. Um, before we throw the meeting open to questions, comments, and discussion with Rick, I'll just make an announcement that the next uh, agnostics group topic will be on Saturday, the 13th of November at 2.30 p.m. That's uh, Melbourne, Australia time, of course. <laughs> and uh, Graham Lindenmayer, is uh, addressing us on the inhabitants of the earth, um, viruses, bacteria, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Nice. So that's uh, one month's time. Okay. Um, it's just now a matter of how we'll go about um, uh, getting some order into this. Um, how would you like it, Rick? People raise their hands. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, people could use the feature in Zoom to raise their hands. We can work our way through. Yes. And uh, anytime there's a pause, I can always take us over to, uh, you know, selected bits of writing of his to okay. kind of start the discussion. So that you'll find that in the, in the reactions icon at the bottom of the screen, the raised hand facility that is. And um, so I suppose, uh, do you want to stop sharing? Yes, okay. Yes. And, so um, uh, Phil, Phil seems to be the first there. Hi, Phil. Hi. You know, in your in your brief synopsis of his career, it seems like his uh, his criticism is primarily about a certain kind of thought that's embedded within culture. So it's mostly about culture. I was uh, glad that you brought in Hegel because he Hegel does m mention, I, I like the fact that you use the word, I mean, the dialectic, meaning the process of unfolding from the bud to the flower to the fruit, rather than thesis, antithesis, synthesis, okay? Because that puts it into a more cultural framework. But it seems to me, even Hegel 
the criticism is, or the discussion is primarily within the context of culture. And it seems to me, I wonder whether that is actually beneficial to use uh, nature as sort of outside factor you could bring in once in a while, but mostly it's about nature. And I wonder whether that doesn't boil down to essentially the metaphor of the fallenness of mind from the Garden of Eden, <laughs> being kicked out <laughs> of the Garden of Eden. Because I, I'm thinking, I, I know that's a, a very simplified and it's probably wrong in that sense, but, but nonetheless, uh, that entirely has to do with the fallenness of the mind in relationship to a certain kind of thinking and that it must be sort of like criticized and, and to a certain degree expanded or eliminated or whatever you do. So, so could you expand upon that fallenness yeah. that, that it didn't include the tree of life enough? Yeah, you bet. So, so the tree of knowledge and tree of life, if Phil brought this up um, a few months ago in our Mythos and Logos series, you know, it makes an interesting metaphor for um, the experiential uh, faculty of the mind, which allows us to um, experience the world, sense the world, to feel strongly the things that we're experiencing, uh, to be connected to our memories of past experiences and have them be present. There is this sort of whole forming faculty of the mind that's very much under discussed in the modern epoch. It's, it's out of fashion. Um, it is scapegoated uh, for everything bad in the world. We always say that uh, what we need is law and order to stand against the chaos. And by law and order, we sort of align ourselves with a logical, rational, planned society. And, and by chaos, we mean subjectivity or emotionalism or, you know, uh, if, if the, 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 the quintessential insult to give somebody in the middle of a heated debate is you call them irrational as though rationality were the ne plus ultra of thinking, as, as though one of the basal faculties of the mind is all good and the other one is, is all sinful and the source of all bad things. Um, and so um, part, of the, part of what he explores, not just in the work of Hegel and Kierkegaard, but, but also in the Greeks and, and going further back, is the idea that um, the balance that modernism strikes between these faculties of the mind is very much unbalanced. Um, this, this thing of praising the logical noetic side of the mind as the source of all goodness and condemning the irrational gnosic side of the mind as the source of all badness, uh, it, it's such a reflex to us that we barely are aware we're doing it. Um, but you can find it in, in figures of speech. Uh, you can find it in the way that we organize our society. And so what becomes really interesting in Kenneth Swift's work is, is where he then says, okay, so that's modernism, but you're not really, because you're a modern, you're used to it. You're going to take it as normal and you're going to wonder, well, what's the alternative, anarchy? You know, there's all, these, there's all this programming in us to make us fearful about what happens if we're too emotional, if we're too subjective. Uh, we, we feel like you know, you, you couldn't build a society out of anything like that. And so what he does is he says, well, let's look at what the medieval world did in contrast to what the modern world does. Let's see how they struck the balance between these different faculties of the mind and what sort of society results when you hit a different balance between those things. And he sets them up, not in opposition, but let's say in contrast to each other. And then on top of that, he goes back to the Greeks and Romans and says, now let's take it further and see a third example because they struck the balance very differently than either the medievals or the moderns. And once you sort of start to look at each of those epochs through its own lenses, through its own balance of, of, of how it thinks you arrive at the truth, gradually you sort of pick up the ability to look at the way we reason and balance our minds in the modern era, not as the culmination of history, not as the most objective best thing that ever happened, but rather as a specific cultural phenomena that can be critiqued, that is, is worth questioning uh, and, and exploring. And so one of his arguments then is that, you know, when the medieval revolution overthrew the ancient world and replaced it uh, with the medieval 
forms of, of, of reasoning and meaning. It was, as Augustine puts it pretty clearly, trying to replace the city of man with all its corruption with the city of God. It was trying to overthrow the hubris of human beings who claimed that they were superior while actually lining their pockets and being corrupt and, and hideous. Uh, it was trying to replace that with God as the authority. And in the course of trying to push back against that corruption and overthrow it, it not only threw out the bad parts, it threw out the good parts too. And in doing that, set itself up for the sorts of problems that would develop over the next thousand years under the medieval epoch, because it, it then created for itself kind of Achilles heels that were distinctive to it because it had given up strengths that had existed in the previous epoch. Yeah, it had its own strengths. And yes, it pushed away a certain number of weaknesses, but you had the baby with the bathwater problem. So he shows us how that works and how it is the, sort of the great tragic irony that the same epoch that was founded originally to replace the corruption of man with the purity of God, that that should end a thousand years later with the church being more corrupt than it had ever been in that entire time, selling indulgences, doing kickbacks, to the point that Martin Luther and others could openly rebel against it and say, my God, you've gone from being what was supposed to be our great hope for the best possibilities for virtue and turned it into the very worst institution that we have. How could you fall so far? You know, it's, it's like out of Greek tragedies that it could do that. But the reason that it did it was because it created certain characteristic weaknesses during its revolution against the ancient epoch. And as with the tragic flaw of the hero in a tragedy, you know, the medieval epoch, its, its weaknesses gradually came to the forefront and became part of the structure and, and, and finally dominated. So once you see that example, it sets you up to then be able to do the far more difficult thing, which is to look at the modern revolution against the medieval epoch. And to say, when we overthrew the medieval epoch, and we pushed back against their structures of meaning and how they how do you how do you how do you make decisions how do you how do you decide which things should take priority over which and so forth when we when we overthrew all that when we said we we wanted a, a nation of laws not men like the founding fathers of the us you know said it over and over what baby were we throwing out along with the bathwater what if if we're if we can give up the ethnocentrism of thinking that we are inherently superior to everybody who came before and that they're all just primitive versions of us if we can see ourselves as another stage in history that has its own distinctive strengths and weaknesses then with the example of the tragedy of medievalism we can start to look at modernism the same way and say so what's what is distinctive about what we pushed back against and what's distinctive about what we substituted for it? And how does that frame us in so that there are certain kinds of problems we were able to solve very effectively that had stymied the medieval order? And yet at the same time, how have we set in motion certain characteristic problems that we're gonna have a very hard time overcoming because we sort of built them into our cultural DNA? And so rather than it just being an issue of sort of a fall from grace, you know, like, like the story of, of, out of Genesis, it's sort of the more complex picture of how in, in attempting to push back against one set of vices and reach for a set, another set of virtues, we did that, but also did un, things that we, we set in motion unintended consequences. And we also, you know, set in motion a set of vices that are, that are gonna be typical of the, of the new epoch. And so what it means is that studying history isn't a waste of time. You know, he, moderns really aren't very interested in history compared to a lot of people in the past. We, we're very now focused. We're very future focused. We, we want our starships. We want to fly in the stars, right? We want to, we want to go to space. We, we're, we're obsessed with the future and, and where we're going. We, we can barely focus on current events, uh, but we really don't want to talk about our history in a straightforward, in, in, in sort of an open, revealing kind of way. But what Kenneth Smith offers us through Hegel and Nietzsche and Kierkegaard and Arendt and others, he, he offers us a way to turn history into a stethoscope for listening to ourselves in a way that we haven't been able to before and to see some of the structures of what makes us tick that previously we took for granted. And part of what Phil's alluding to is that one of the things that you can see when you do that is the extent to which we have bet the farm on reason and mechanical organization, right? When you look at the way that modernist nations construct their systems of laws, it's like we're trying to make a great program 
And if everybody would just be a computer and follow the program, then everything would be okay. And we argue that, you know, when chaos erupts, when, 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 when people, you know, disregard the law and they, they introduce anarchy, it, it threatens everything and everything could fall apart because, you know, how dare you mess with the great machine? The great machine is where all goodness will come from. Uh, you know, you shouldn't, don't feel so much, just be professional, just be, just be logical, just follow the rules. You, you know, we've turned that up to a level, no civilization that we know about in recorded history has ever done before. And it has made it possible to, you know, fly to the moon, right? It's made it possible to, you know, get these amazing missions to Jupiter and so forth. But, but at the same time, it's also made it so that, you know, we have this incredibly high suicide rate. And we have, you know, children shooting up schools, and we have enormous outbreaks of people who just don't find it satisfying to live this way. Uh, it might be a, a way of life that would be suitable for a cyborg or for a computer, but for us, it's sort of a half-life because we're appealing to half of the mind and then scapegoating and suppressing the other half. Which, which leaves us all feeling out of balance. And I think that's what Phil's alluding to with the tree of life versus the, the tree of knowledge. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Bryce is waving his hand at us. Hi, Bryce. Um, hi, yeah. So as you're talking about that, um, what comes to mind is kind of like the problem with Socrates, um, Nietzsche, um, talking about kind of rationalism and, and calling for more of a call back to the instincts, um, to the stronger uh, societies, like the Greeks and the Romans, as he puts it, that uh, um, were predating like the, the Judeo-Christian values of, uh, I guess, um, I mean, I don't know if that's, if that's necessarily a, a, a fault of rationalism, but uh, Nietzsche definitely uh, associates them to the, the Christian uh, value system. And, and uh, I'm wondering if, if in any sense, um, uh, Kenneth Smith is making that argument or uh, making an argument against more of the Newtonian and uh, like Francis Bacon's just concepts of science and using that type of method of um, autonomizing um, issues and just re reducing them. Uh, I'm trying to, to, to find um, if, if, if he's offered really kind of a framework of any particular culture, um, an idea that he thinks um, is a proper alternative to modernism. I, I'm actually wow, that not is very versed in him, so. That's a cornucopia of fantastic questions there, Bryce. Uh, so let's let's see how would we how do we approach answering this? So one thing is is he 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 never offers a utopian systemic answer to anything. Uh, that's that's not his approach. But what he does want to do is show you very clearly counterexamples uh, that that uh, once you know what to look for can't be mistaken for the thing that you're critiquing. And because of that, you can then in your own mind, begin to search for other counterexamples to see the alternatives of the different ways that people can live. And not because he's pitching any one of them, but just to get into the habit of breaking free of the kind of ruts of thought that we're trained into. We're, we're trained at, for example, take the word rational. Um, you know, rational to us is inherently good. Anything that you do with your brain that's, that's, that, that produces good results, is often called rational, regardless of whether you use the rational side of your mind to do it or not. You might, it might've been the result of a deeply subjective creative thing. It might've been the result of just strict empathy that you were really listening to people. And so you were able to understand them better such that the rational side was really at best a caboose on what was actually a, a you know, sort of deeply gnosic operation instead of a noetic operation. But we will still credit rationality with, with that was why we, we got a good result. And if something bad happens as a result of our reasoning, we almost never blame reason. We almost always blame the irrational side. We have this way of, you know, we, we sort of have this instinctive scapegoating uh, uh, reflex that, that we've been trained into doing. The classic example is, 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 the, is Nazis, World War II, right? We say the reason the Holocaust happened was because of irrationality. We say irrational prejudice. 
we say it was their hatred, it was their rage that made them kill so many people. But what's interesting about that, and we, and we do that because we want to blame emotions for the cause of all the great evils. And we want, and by doing that, we want to keep the hands of rationality completely clean and pristine. We want to maintain this idea that reason only leads to good things and that irreason only leads to bad things. And the problem for us is that's not actually the case at all. It was the most scientifically advanced country in the world. It wasn't a, a back, it wasn't a backwards country full of, you know, internal rages and hates that couldn't ever get themselves figured out scientifically or mathematically. It was the best mathematicians in the world, the best scientists in the world, the best engineers in the world. It was the most rational country in the world. And that's why they were able to kill so many people. They used computers to organize the operation. They used manufacturing, they used industry, they used all the powers of reason to carry out what they did. But we can't stand blaming reason for anything because the deal we have is that reason is all good and irrationality is all bad. So we say, well, it's just bigotry and hatred. And if we all just wouldn't be bigoted and hateful, then things like the Holocaust wouldn't happen. In, in preparation for tonight, I was rereading Eichmann in Jerusalem uh, by Hannah Arendt. Anybody who hasn't read Eichmann in Jerusalem, you just gotta. It's one of the most important books of the 20th century. This is the book that coined the term the banality of evil. Because what she saw in Eichmann's trial was not a man who was filled with bigotry and rage and hate. He was a very calm, rational, organized man who just wanted to do a good job at his job. And he didn't want to rock the boat or make any waves. He was obedient. He followed the law and he wanted to be successful. And that was it. That's how he did all that evil, through reason and through, and through all the things that we praise as only being good were the source of the evil. That's, that's how it came about. Uh, and for us, that's intolerable as moderns because it goes against our programming. So the reason I'm harping on this is it means that when we talk about what could the alternatives be, to the way we live now. Before we can even talk about that, we need to get a clearer understanding of exactly how are we living now? I mean, how do we think? Why do we see the world the way that we do? How is that different from the way other people have seen it? All of our terminology, all of the core concepts that we reason with to try to understand what it means to be human, what it means to be modern, what it means to be good or civilized, every one of these terms has been massively corrupted. We are in a state of extreme confusion about the most basic things. If you go back and read the sophists, the ancient Greek sophists, they'll tell you straight up, oh yeah, we're totally going to teach you how to make the bad argument look like a good argument. We're going to teach you rhetoric so that you can beat the other guy. And you'll totally be lying, but you'll win anyway. Right. They're like really forthright about what they're doing because they're in a culture that pretty much tells the truth. Even when they're lying, they lie in a very different way than we do. And you can see it in their writings. They think about the world differently. They think about themselves differently. They think about communication differently than we do. And by you wanna see that not so that we become them or struggle to be those people, but so that you can then turn back around and look at us and go, whoa, okay, something distinctive about us is that we don't do that. When it comes to how does the brain work, we are very befuddled. My classic example of this is Hegel. In, in the phenomenology of Geist, Hegel has very precise, very clear terminology that he uses to describe the basal metabolism of the mind and how the different functions relate to each other, how they develop out of each other, how they conceive of the world differently and how they conceive of thinking differently. And then he describes how a mature human being is supposed to grow beyond those two basal metabolic functions to develop the third function that allows them to infinitize them both and apply them to, a, to a, you know, a larger world, to be capable of stretching beyond the limits of our experience. And all of that is done with crisp language. But whenever it's translated into English, it turns into gibberish. You'll find sentences contrasting the notion with the understanding, with the idea, and you read it, no matter how many times you read it, you're like, but in English, we don't make those distinctions. The sentence doesn't make sense. Why would you say that the notion is concrete and the understanding is abstract? None of it makes sense in English. What's happening is these translators are, are tied up with this 
orthodoxy that you're supposed to translate all the terms, that you're not allowed to import any terms from the other language. And as a result, they're trying to say something that can't be expressed in English. If you try to use the words that English has for thinking to say the sentences that Hegel is trying to say, it's a muddle because all these most important terms that we need to understand who we are and how we think were never designed to do this in English. That wasn't what they were built for. And so as a result, there's sort of this process by which if you want to understand free will, if you want to understand you know, virtue, if you want to understand truth or honesty or, or you know, how the mind works or how culture works, English is a problem for us unless you bring in new terminology and establish how you're going to use it and what it's going to apply to. So there's a lot of work to be done before we reach the stage where we're able to seriously consider where should we go from here? Because we still don't quite know where here is, if that makes sense. So Kenneth Smith spends a bunch of time working on this. I see Phil and Stephen have their hands up. Okay, should Phil, we go to them? your turn. So oh, Stephen's before me. Oh, okay. I just, I'm just going to out the rationalists in the audience. You know, he's hiding amongst us. Les Allen. He's just, he's just put a question in the chat. I was just wondering how you would handle it. Did Eichmann use reason to choose the right goals of government and society? No. So well, he did, in fact. <laughs> yeah, they used reason. They used reason. It, it, the, the, I'm glad you brought that up, Stephen. So, so the reason looks like this, right? Germany, you know, went through a cultural period where they were raised, people were growing up on these a German novels about the Wild West in the United States. And they were reading about how the original 13 colonies were able to expand across an entire continent. And by doing that became incredibly wealthy and became a superpower. And Germany was saying, we've gone about as far as, for, first of all, Germany was saying we're reeling from the reparations from World War I and our economy is a disaster and everybody's treating us like crap. And at this point, we pretty much hate everybody. Not in the sense of hate, but we really resent being in this position. We have to somehow bootstrap ourselves to get going again. And they looked at the example of the United States and said, well, if the United States could expand West and by doing that become incredibly powerful and wealthy, why can't we expand East? Why can't Slavs be the 20th century equivalents of Native Americans? back in the 18th and 19th centuries. This is what they were telling each other. This is what they were, you know, the, Carl May was writing these novels about how glorious it was to expand your frontiers and, and, to, and all of the opportunities that it made possible. You know, Hitler even had people reading Carl May's novels if they wanted to move ahead. So what we're talking about is a country that was thinking about its options and was saying, we're militarily more powerful. We're technologically more advanced. We could expand into Eastern Europe and double, triple, quadruple the size of this country, get all those resources and use that to build our industrial base. So yes, it was a rational process. And in fact, that's the problem, is that empathy is not a rational process, right? Love and shame and humility, all the things that you need to rein yourself in to, to not treat people like resources, these are not rational processes. They're part of the other part of the brain, the part that's, sub, that's subdued under modernism. And so it was a very modern thing to do, to say, oh yeah, let's totally treat people like resources, let's expand our industrial base. And in order to do that, you know, we might have to move a bunch of people around, was what they were thinking when they started into their project with the Jews. It was only later that they said, well, nobody seems to want them, so we'll take the other rational choice. It's the problem, this is, this is the problem is, because we don't want reason to be accountable for anything that it ever does wrong, we have to distort our understanding of our own history in order to create one part of our, our, our mind that's a saint and the other part of our mind that's a sinner and blame all of the saints' failings on the sinner. This is how we read the Holocaust and how we read World War II. And, and it's why we're sort of on track to do it again. It's why there's such a rise in, in fascism and totalitarianism around the world. We never did understand what happened because that kind of level of understanding flies in the face of our modernist programming about who and what we are and how we got here. Thanks for bringing that up, Stephen. Okay, Phil, it's your turn. Yeah, I, 
to me, you can't blame it all on modernism. I mean, it, it, it's perhaps, uh, it's a further manifestation of that. To me, it really began with splitting the stone, the technology into, into it, because what that did, you know, I've been taught there are three, three proofs for truth. There's probably more, but these are three that I've taught. One is correspondent, correspondent to the data points. Uh, the, the other one is functionality. Well, it works. <laughs> it works, okay? And the right. third is coherence, right? Does that make sense? And it seems to me we, we are ignoring a little bit of the coherence aspect of making sense uh, because we left the sense out of it. And, and, and my thought is that, you know, when you split the stone and, and you live in a dangerous world, hey, guys, it works. <laughs> it works. We could survive, right? right? And then, of course, you split the stone and you can say, we can make pyramids, we can make temples. It works. <laughs> what the hell you want? You know, it's like to the degree that the technos that's embedded in that kind of functionality has manifested in, in a mechanical structure that in a sense has transformed our mind to exclude other things to a certain degree, other way of thinking. Right. And my, my thought is that it, it, in a sense, it has produced a civilization in which uh, there seems to be no exit. We can't do without the stuff that works. I mean, it's like, you know, you're going to go back like, oh, you're going to be a hunter and gather. No, no, thanks. I mean, it works. The mechanical system of the economy, it works until it doesn't work. OK. And so I'm wondering if this over dependency on the workingness of it has made us forgot, you know, and, and that reminds me, you know, I, I just learned this afresh from Heidegger, you know that the origin of thinking, the inceptual thinking, is that it somehow trans is able to translate and put into a relationship between sensing and thinking. That's the initial part, which is already in contact with the world. And in the world, things are, are at least somewhat mysterious, and that produces the initial thinking that maybe you go ref you need to refine, but it originates from sensing, and we have let the sense <laughs> out of it to the degree that you know, like I'm going to convince you it works. What the hell you want? <laughs> you, want right. you want the touchy feely thing? So I wonder whether at this point we can we even double back, except at best at a very slow process. You know, because like we have become so dependent, you know, like the roads. I mean, you, you think about it wouldn't take much for somebody and the dams and the waterways for somebody to just bomb a few key points and you break Los Angeles is going to go uh, <laughs> very thirsty, very easily. Right. And so in a sense, and then you could say, well, if it no longer, well, we could just tweak the mechanics of that system, which is called engineering, and we'll make it work, <laughs> right? So in some sense, it's become techno-oriented in that sense. Now, I'm not going to put down technology because it's important uh, to the degree now that we so dependent on it, especially. But on the other hand, should we put such an emphasis on that that we exclude other things, you know, and just say, we just want stuff to work. Could you just fix it? You know what I mean? You kind of get angry when the, when the plumber comes around. <laughs> He's supposed to be an expert and he doesn't fix it. So, well, well you, you, you're not fixing it. I want the fix to make it work for heaven's sakes. You know, I, I don't want to talk philosophy or anything else. <laughs> I don't want you to do a painting. I just want to, you to make it work. So how we become so depend on that, that we can no longer return to the inception of thinking, the thinking that is actually connected to sensing in the world, that it presents itself, but it hides also because it always leads to another question rather than a question leads to an answer to make it work. 
So, you know, the thing about this is that, well, there's a couple of things. So one is that to criticize modernism and criticize um, sort of like overly noetic rationalism sounds like, it sounds like it's a back to the trees movement, right? where we, we, we are so allergic to criticism that if you dare to criticize us, we assume you must be an extremist. Only an extremist would criticize us. The norm is to praise us relentlessly for being the best and the brightest, the most objective, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it's, it's hard to strike the balance on the nuance on this because being an overly Apollonian society that's, that's highly noetic driven, it means that a lot of our mistakes are noetic mistakes. And that means that if we're gonna be properly held accountable, if we're gonna be critiqued, it means a lot of what needs to be critiqued about us is the noetic side. But that doesn't mean that we're opposed to noesis, that we, that, we, that we hate intellectualization, that we hate reason. On the contrary, it's one of the two basal faculties of the mind. We need it. It's, it's part of why we evolved, right? If we, if we could somehow excise that part of our brain from ourselves, you know, we'd fail as a species. It's, 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 uh, you know, cats, cats have their stock and pounce, or possibly they're walking in front of the screen. Uh, you know, horses have their fabulous running. You know, we have this, this pair of unusual capabilities in our brain, and we need them both. But to talk about what's going wrong in the modern order, it means that we've got to criticize one of them more than the other, because what's going wrong is that we're out of balance, and one of them is responsible for more of the decisions than the other one is. Um, so it's a challenge. So he's not talking about a return to the past. And part of the reason he wouldn't talk about that is, you know, the dialectic motion of history and development goes forward. It, it never goes backward. The fruit never refolds back into a blossom and the blossom never refolds back into a bud. That's, that's not the direction that time zero goes. And so the goal isn't to like return to some early utopian stage that we were in but rather to move forward from where we are and to move forward only next to something that's possible from the stage of development that we're at. It's like, where can we go from here is not most of the places that we can imagine, but only the things that could be natural developments out of the stage of history that we're in at the moment. And you know, for the, the prospects as far as bringing balance back to bear in the way that we conceive of the world, the good news is that we're all born in a completely begriff mode, to use Hegel's terminology, 100% gnosis, right? An infant, like we've talked about in the, in the Mythos and Logos series, an, an infant is a live wire who's completely connected to everything. That when they feel things, they feel it with 100% of their body. <laughs> you know, it's like when they're hungry, they are so hungry. Everything is hunger. And then when they're fed and they feel good, everything is fabulous. I mean, it's like there's this complete connection right? So we all started out that way. And every new generation, they all start out that way too. It's not like we can lose track of it because it's wired right into us. It's, it's, it's a faculty. On top of that, in our adult life, a lot of the dissatisfaction that we feel with the overly mechanized life takes the form of eruptions in that side that we, that we were so good at as an infant, that we're so bad at as an adult. We feel the absence right? We feel despair. We feel frustration. We feel boredom. We feel all these emotions interfere with what was supposed to be the nice, tidy, logical program that if we just followed all the rules, uh, everything would be great. And instead it isn't. And the only reason that we know it isn't is because the, uh, the neglected side of the mind is pushing on us, saying, this doesn't feel right. This isn't complete. I'm not, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm part of a healthy whole system. I feel isolated. I feel cut off and I feel cut off from myself even, and that has to be fixed. So even if we don't know which direction these things would drive us, they're still present with us and they're still pushing on us, encouraging us to do something about it. And I think most people, even in the most mechanized life, from time to time, every so often we have peak experiences where it breaks through, whether it's the first time that we're standing in front of the Grand Canyon, whether it's trying a food we've never had before and discovering it's amazing and where has this been all our life? Whether it's we suddenly smell something it takes us back to a childhood memory that was happy. We have these little eruptions 
into our life that remind us, you know, of, of the of the good things that we're longing for. Uh, we just don't know yet how to put it all together. And if all we do is follow the recipe that we're given by the sort of anti-culture we've grown up in, we're not going to get there. We, we've got to be creative and sort of figure out how to listen to that part of us and, and how to weave it back into our life so that we can be a whole person again and think with our whole mind and not just sort of in a half-witted mode that we're trained to do. Hi, Stephen, you've got your hand up. It's your turn. Uh, yeah, I've explored the issue of rationalism a bit in my life, thought about it quite a bit. And to my understanding, and I wouldn't say the rational, the rationalist position is a wrong one. It, ha it has a right place. But to me, a rationalist is a person He's looked at the world of physics. He's looked at the Newtonian characteristic of the universe, so to speak, and th thought, gee, I'm really smart. I've worked out precisely measured. Rational means to measure. Reason means to measure. I can measure the phenomena, you know, the, uh, the uh, physical world, draw conclusions and control it. Yeah. Mm, I can move on now. Oh, there's a metaphysical world, the subjective world of the mind. Surely I can subject that to my mechanical outlook as well. We can completely right. predict the mind and we can create the perfect world order where every human personality operates like the perfect 100% machine. And this is... The erroneous goal of the rationalist, it's all right to explore from that angle. I'm cool with that, but don't think it's the be all and end all because I think the universe, there's elements in the universe which are just beyond our concepts of measurement. Yes. The rationalists just don't seem to understand that their reason, their reason is the, of some creature that calls themselves humans which are only a step up from a dog. What makes them think that their reason, their level of reason is so great? It's right. that pride again. So right. he, he, here's the interesting element, Kenneth Smith's pointing out, is the vanity of the modern. We, we're not dealing with reason anymore. We're dealing with, and it was Wilhelm Reich pointed out, the risk of the emotional plague. Yeah. That modern man talks about reason and yet is so subject to emotionalism and outright superstition. Yeah. Yeah, and we and we take it so for granted because it's so familiar to us that we don't recognize it for what it is. That was one of the quotes I put on the Hegel slide. You know, Hegel talks about the way that familiarization is the process of forgetting the interesting features of the things that we encounter until they seem normal to us, even if they're completely abnormal. But because we see them so often, we take them for granted. It's how the metaphorical frog in the pot with the water going up works, is you know temperature that if we were to encounter it for the first time out of nowhere, we'd say, well, that's way too hot. But if it's gone up one degree at a time over a long period, it always just seemed like a small change. And now it seems familiar and we don't recognize that it's not healthy at all, that we're, we're Things are not going the way that they ought to be going. So, yeah, it, 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 it's one of the reasons why there's a lot of backlash against Kenneth Smith's writing when people encounter it is that, you know, a steady diet of sugar doesn't prepare you for a, for a well-rounded palate. Uh, if you're so used to being flattered for being a modern, and if, if modernism is always held up as the best and the brightest and, 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 and you know, the solution to all problems, it sets us up in a position where we can't hear criticism of it. We can't bear criticism of it because suddenly it's calling into question our entire program for how we think we're going to solve all of the world's problems, which is more uh, of the same. Surely that's advertising. That's propaganda. Yeah. When people say that, what are they trying to sell us? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Stephen. What are these modernists? What, what's it? Who are these door-to-door -door salesmen called modernists? What are they? They're knocking on our door and they're trying to sell us something and they're trying to fool us into thinking that this is, a, this is the product to buy. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Bryce has 
has his hand up. Hi, Bryce. Go ahead. <laughs> Gotta find your mute. Um, sorry about that. It was just some muting. Um, so um, there's a great book, Nietzsche and the Nazis, where they discuss kind of the um, ideologies of Germany at the time um, being overwhelmingly popular, especially among many of the intellectuals. Um, yes. So interesting having similar ties to communistic ideologies and in intellectual spaces, but it they weren't lightweights at all philosophically. And you know, Hitler was a voracious reader, um, basically um, pointing to the fact that a lot of these ideas we trivialize um, modernly, and we just look at the end results. Um, basically, uh, you know the. The, Nietzsche was the philosopher of the Nazis. Uh, I don't know why they chose him. With, uh, they, they, they tend to, to really uh, vibe with his call back towards strong qualities and the emotions. And I, I, at least for me, there's some confusion about a lot of these talks where rationalism is, for whatever reason, linked to stoicism, kind of like a suppression of the emotionality and not connected to more like Newtonian critical thinking and uh, logical scientific methods. Um, and for me, I, the, the thing that comes up when I'm thinking about this is more like a Jungian understanding that there's archetypes that wherever there are, whatever the culture, there's just common, you know, collective archetypes. So if, you know, biblical, Christian archetypes are suppressed and you'll you'll see in comic books similar themes with certain characters basically expressing like the most extreme of don't do this or to do this which I think what we are talking about when we talk about the Nazis for me the metaphor is always kind of like okay here's a nightmare how can we avoid this nightmare situation I don't think people understand it from a union perspective is like no, what is the nightmare trying to tell us? Like what's actually the archetype? What's the value within that? Because for me, there's a actual articulation from a conscious perspective yeah. of that unconsciousness. And there's a marriage between the, the more explorative, you know, the more deeper aspects of the brain, the past, the hypothalamic regions, and the actual like cortical function that allows you to really articulate, oh, you know what, I've, I've connected with my emotions and um, instinctually, like, you know, I, I keep having these inclinations um, because there's, there's some essential need in a, hum, uh, in a humanistic aspect that that unconscious psychic remnant that goes from society to society to society is telling us. And I feel like that's kind of what you're mentioning about Kenneth Smith is that he's actually, for me, very union in the aspect of he's understanding like cross-culturally what values need to be um, mined for treasure. And that, you know, I actually haven't read Kenneth Smith, but I'm really feeling very strongly like that connection there. Yeah, yeah, he, he's, a, he's a big advocate of, of cross-cultural comparisons. It, it makes things very interesting. You know, the thing about Nietzsche is that Nietzsche's sister was in charge of his estate and his writings, and she was dating an anti-Semite during the era when anti-Semitism in Germany was on the rise, and uh, she wanted to make the an her, her anti-Semite boyfriend happy, so... Um, she saw that they needed sort of some intellectual framework to work with. And uh, after Nietzsche died, she cut up a bunch of his work and rearranged it to make it seem like it supported German nationalism and anti-Semitism and all that, which is ironic because Nietzsche wrote very clearly about how much he despises anti-Semites, how much he respects the Jews, how disgusting he thought German nationalism was, all the things, but, it, but his sister and her, his sister's you know, boyfriend managed to do an editing job that turned him inside out so that up until Walter Kaufman did his new revelatory series of translations in the mid 20th century, until then everybody thought he was the philosopher of the Nazis. And it's, it's you know, it, 
Kaufman's translations are the way to go with Nietzsche because he also talks about that history. He explains how it happened and shows how if you go back to the original manuscripts, you would never confuse Nietzsche with a Nazi. Nazis are exactly the sorts of people that would have made him barf. You know, he's just like, I suck so bad. Uh, and there they are going, Nietzsche's our guy. You know, you just, if anybody was ever spinning in his grave, you know, Nietzsche spun for a good 60 years there uh, in, in, in rage and frustration at what was done with his work. Um, but yeah, you know, Kenneth Smith's line is that, uh, you know, it, the, the core of it is the epistemology. And the idea that if we can give up the sort of hubris of modernism in assuming that everything we think is the product of, of thousands of years of, of culmination and the greatest possible opinions and insights, and that everything that we think is objective and true, if we can give that up and see ourselves as a cultural phenomena, it opens the door to us being able to look at how other people have understood the world. You know, I'm struck, for example, by the way that um, you know, it was just in the last week or two I guess in the last month, uh, they discovered a new set of footprints, uh, fossil footprints in, in uh, North America. I don't know how many people have seen this, that uh, date so far back that uh, the only way that, uh, that people could have made those footprints if the, is if they'd been here thousands of years even before that, because there was a big glaciation going on. And so the new estimate is that indigenous peoples have been in North and South America for at least 30,000 years. Uh, and in my lifetime, when I was a kid, uh, I was told that was not the case. People hadn't been here for more than 10,000 years, if that. They believed that Clovis culture was the very first people to ever show up in North America. Indigenous people weren't really indigenous. They were really Siberian people who were just traipsed in here, you know, just a little while before we got here. And so really, why shouldn't we take everything? Because it's not really theirs anyway. They were, they were immigrants just like we are. And they always pushed back. The indigenous people always said, our stories tell us that we've been here a lot longer than that. And what we said is, yeah, but that's just primitive bullshit. Anything that you think is irrational nonsense. So we can, we can ignore that. And we will only pay attention to the rational, structured, scientific information that tells us what's true. And it turns out the problem with doing that is that science has never promised to give us absolute truth or complete truth. All science gives us is a way to gradually, incrementally cut away bad ideas. And it takes time. And just because science doesn't, hasn't arrived at something yet doesn't mean that it won't in another 50 or 60 years. And so what we really should have been doing this whole time is saying, well, we've got two different stories. We've got, we've got the evidence that so far only goes back 10,000 years, but we've got these stories that it goes back further. Let's look around and see if we can find anything longer than that. But that's not what we did. That would have been the scientific thing to do, right? The whole, the whole minded thing to do would be to take into, into account both pieces of evidence. But what we did instead is say, your evidence is too right-brained and, and you're, 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 you know, we're going to disregard all of it. And we're going to assume that absence of evidence equals evidence of absence. We did a very non-scientific ultra-rational thing when we decided that Clovis had to have been the first because that was all the evidence that we had. And this is an example of the ways in which they're very subtle shifts from one track to another in the reasoning of our brain can result in dramatically non-empirical, but very rational conclusions that, are, that, that turn out to be false. The same sort of thing goes on when you, when you look at why were we not able to address the climate crisis earlier when we first began to suspect that we were causing problems? Why could we not address, you know, if you go thing after thing after thing that's going wrong right now, why couldn't we have addressed it earlier? A lot of it comes down to just little tricks of reasoning that, that, that reason when it's ungrounded from empiricism will allow you to do. And more importantly, reason when it's ungrounded from a whole-minded approach where we're, where we're humble about our opinions, you know, that might've saved us a lot of effort. Okay, Nariman. You'll go. Hi, Nariman. Hey, how are you? So Good. I have a question. We're talking about modernism and that um, rational world. So how would you define love and feelings in this modern and rational world? Well, that's where it gets interesting, doesn't it? Because, you know, a, a strictly rationalist argument about love, an ultra-modernist take on love, is it's like a personal choice, or it's a consumer good, or it's just some chemicals in the brain, 
there's, there's this attempt to reduce it down to some simple mechanical thing. And what's missing from that is the whole human experience of empathy and bonding with another person and how it changes the way you feel about yourself and the world. All of those things that are the most important about love are missing from all of the reductionist approaches to defining love. And so this is part of where you see the, the difference between these two sides of the mind. You know, when, you're, when you're working on the side of the mind that's strictly rational, the strictly rational side of the mind wants to follow its programming. It likes logic and order. It likes programs. It, it, it wants to do the logical deduction step by step and whatever conclusion you arrive at, well, that must be the truth because I was logical. And if I was logical, it must be true. And the problem is that the great Achilles heel of logic is its premises, right? If your premises mm -hmm. are wrong, and it doesn't matter how valid your logic is, you're still not going to get to the truth because you started in the wrong place, facing the wrong direction. And so it goes with love. You know, love is clearly a potent, powerful part of what it is to be human. It's a massive part of the human experience. And experience is something the non-logical side of our brain is really good at, but the logical side of our brain is really, really bad at. Okay, Natalia, it's your Thank turn. you. Uh, yeah, I was listening to what Stephen was talking about earlier on rationalism, and I think like that was actually really important. Because I think like part of the trend now in like modern society is like the need for instant gratification, you know, like for convenience that people need like instant answers for things without really thinking through what they are, you know. And that's like really broad. I can say like maybe like even simple things like the vaccines, like like people are people tend to think that they will completely cure the, the virus for a long for, for uh for a long time. But the truth is that maybe it will only last for a few months or something. And yeah, so my point was just like I think um it doesn't really leave room for each of us like individuals to think for ourselves like what we really want is it just something like well even if the authorities like tell us it, um that it'll help or is it strengthen our immunity will will it really will it really um diminish the symptoms and you know yeah so that's my point <laughs> Yeah, one of the best parts of, of science is that is that it's not strictly rational. You know, the um, the history of science, we often credit the Greeks for science, but but we shouldn't. It's the Arabs that we should be crediting for science because when they got the translations of the Greeks, they went through and tried a whole bunch of the things that the Greeks said were true. And only some of it was true. A lot of it fell apart under testing. And the early Arab and Persian writers, you know, when you read them, you can see how baffled they are because the Greeks were held in such high esteem as the pinnacle of reason. And so how could they be so persuasive and yet so wrong so much of the time? <clears throat> and what gradually, and it took a long time, I mean, this was, this was something that Europe took much longer to figure out than the Arabs did, but even the Arabs who were working on it and working on it, it took them a long time to work out too. They gradually arrived at the conclusion that there is a massive Achilles heel to reason, which is that, most things that are rational and reasonable and logical are still false. The, the world is not bound by human logic or reason. It may take us generations to work out why something real is real the way that it is. You know, the, the, the problem of magnets took thousands of years to solve. You know, it's like people had magnets very early on. They knew about lodestones back in the ancient world, but they just could not figure out what was making it go. And their, their attempts to reason out a solution were just all wrong. All of them were wrong. Uh, it, we, it, it, it wasn't until our empirical investigation skills became strong enough that we found a way to let the real world knock on our heads and break through our logic with, with evidence that could tell us Okay, of all these possible reasonable ideas, chuck all of those because you know this is the only one that, that points in the right direction. Same is true of static electricity. They knew about static electricity from early on, but they couldn't figure out why it was happening or what it was about. Uh, and all the ideas that they came up with, all their logic, all the, they convinced so many people of so many different theories and they were all wrong because they weren't actually theories, right? They weren't scientific in any way. Specifically, it was reason that was not anchored 
to real world experience. The thing that makes science great when science is behaving itself correctly is that science lets the real world of experience intrude into our logic and reason. And it forces logic and reason to share the stage with what it's like to actually experience the world. So, you know, my favorite example of this dynamic between experience and logic um, is, um, God, I wish I could remember his name. Uh, when Einstein came out with the theory that light isn't just a wave, but is also a particle, it was extremely controversial. Um, and the man who was the, the doyen of physics at the time, I'd have to look him up again. I don't have his name off the tip of my tongue. He was the most famous physicist in the world at that time. And he was the one that everybody wanted to impress and they wanted his good opinion. He just would not accept this particle idea. He thought that was the stupidest thing. He was thought it Max, Einstein had Max really, Planck? It's not Planck, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he, thought, he thought Einstein had really gone off the rails. And so he set out to prove it. And he spent, I think it was 15 years building the best lab in the world with the best equipment, inventing things nobody had invented before in order to do the test to prove that Einstein was wrong. And instead, in the end, he ended up proving that Einstein was right. He provided the evidence <laughs> that Einstein needed to finish the theory. And Could that be in, Michelson or Morley? It's not him. They, they did the famous experiment of, with the ether. Yes. Yes, he did the ether experiment, but this wasn't the ether guy. So, so the point is that, is that even somebody who was as well versed in physics as this gentleman was, was trying to reason from what he knew to apply it to a scenario that he didn't have the expertise in. And even though he had more expertise than Einstein, he still logically came to the wrong conclusion. And it wasn't until he tried to build the lab to provide the empirical evidence to prove that his logic was right, that he was able to prove that his logic was wrong instead and prove that Einstein was right. It really shows the extent to which you can be at the top of your game. You can be the most educated, most rational, most rigorous, most respected person in the world, and your reasoning is still wrong. No, it's perfect reasoning. It's all valid. There's nothing wrong with it as far as it goes. But when you move out into the realm of the unknown, you know, you need to experience the unknown to let it teach you what's going on. You can only logic so far in advance of experience before you get into trouble. So I, I you know, I wish I had his name handy for you, but you can look him up. No, it's okay. <laughs> If you know, if you if you Google Einstein and the and the the particle model of, of light and look for who was the physicist who opposed him, uh, you'll find the guy. And uh, you know, he was a Nobel winner. He was a really famous guy. But uh, but you know, if he can screw it up, then the rest of us can screw it up. <laughs> I guess is, is is what I'm saying. We have to treat reason and logic and and rigorous, you know, analytical modes of thinking that take place entirely inside of our head with skepticism. And we need to give more credit to experience because experience lets the world in, the world has things to teach us. Whether it's about Agreed. whether it's about a vaccine or anything else. Yeah. Okay, Bryce, it's your go. Well, um, yeah, it's, to me, I, you know, I just feel like after like Francis Bacon and Isaac Newton, we really moved past the scientific rationality of like making grandiose. I mean, I, I would think from a rational standpoint that we moved past um, taking something and then making it kind of apply to everything else. Like, oh, okay, I have a theory now that gives me an insight into all other theories. And it's all these examples of where science becomes like a concrete truth finding thing. I, I feel like those people were anti, you know, anti that process. They were more sciences, as you were saying, um, more of a, a means to have a, a feeling of uncertainty, okay? Uh, not of, of absoluteness. And so um, I just feel like that's the truth you know, of the religiousness that came before them. And, and when we talk about more rationalism, it's just so interesting to me that it's considered to be at, at in some way not conducive with more of the exploratory natures of us because 
you know, what is the point of exploration other than to test and trial different narratives and different ideas, and then to come back with those narratives and to make more um, informed decisions. And to me, that's a scientific process. Um, so, you know, I do not see, I, I see the, the, the lack of openness as irrational. In fact, all these examples to me um, of these people who were not open to new concepts without more uh, evidence, I find that to be not a rational um, fallacy. You know, I find that to be just, just something of a lack of openness for exploration. So I, for me, I, I don't see how these are at ends with each other. Yeah, this is this is an example of where you know English fails us because rational has several quite different meanings, and it's irrational in the sense of they're not using their whole minds, and they should know better than what they're doing. But on the other hand, it's perfectly rational because a rational system can be anything. People people can be trained to follow any set of rules, uh, and. And whether they're rules of thought or rules of laws or rules of the economy, people have this mimetic power. We have an ability to immerse ourselves in these different contexts and to immerse ourselves so completely that we forget that we're immersed in it. And we think that, that we're actually, that that's how the whole world really is, that it is the way that we're reasoning. And so, you know, if, if someone's intellectual programming tells them that they need to be open-minded and they disobey that, then they're being irrational. But if their intellectual programming tells them that they don't need to be open-minded because their, their system of reasoning already accounts for everything, then when they push away other ideas, they're being perfectly rational because the rational system tells them to push away other ideas. This is, the, this is the problem with reason is that reason is so abstracted from experience and from reality that it can either model the world very well or it can model the world very poorly but either way, it's an addictive process for the rational side of our mind to engage in it. Can, can I just interject and just say, you know, one of the things that I thought Isaac Newton did so well was to point out that the, the quality of the reason is based upon the results, you know, the testable results of it. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's, that's following up on the Arabs, isn't it? Because the moment you start holding ideas accountable, now you're now you're bringing in that other half of the brain that says, "Wait, what about experience? We, we need to go see what we actually experience when we trust these ideas in the world. It's not enough to reason about them; they have to be, they have to be experienced." So I'm, I'm with you. I also like what you said about the the Persians because Darius, you know, the the Greeks had no idea about engineering and how he he tracked all the way across the world. At that time, the Greeks were not even uh, nationalized. They, they had no idea about that kind of engineering to have supply lines to, it all came from the Persians uh, in yeah. terms of that kind of technology. Yeah, that's right. Okay, Fally, you. it's your turn. Hi, Fally. Uh, hi, Rick. Uh, uh, I just, I really like what you have said, uh, everything. Uh, <laughs> And uh, but, yeah, but one thing uh, I think I, I, I want to maybe explore a little bit more is I feel like when, like today, when we're talking about reasoning, it's a mixture of reasoning with uh, rationalizing. Because my understanding is to reason, you don't come with a hidden agenda. You don't have a you know, pre-assumption don't have a goal, don't have an end. But to rationalize, normally you have a goal already and you're probably just justifying uh, like the end in order to you know, manipulate or yeah, whatever. So I, I think that's not very uh, much clarified in today's uh, conversations. Yeah, but that's right. my question. Uh, my question is more about uh, what are, uh, Mr. Smith's uh, psychological side of work. Uh, what's his focus? A social uh, logical stuff, or yeah, yeah. I want to yeah. know more about that. Yeah, I'd love to. I could give you a quick capsule summary. Sure. Thank you. So yeah, uh, you know, 
Hague, even though it's very hard to read in English, if you can get through the bad translations, Hegel has a lot to say about the way that we conceive of the world. He says, the modes of thought aren't just tools in a toolbox. They are all encompassing for us. They become identities for us when we're engaging in those modes of thought. And so there's a relationship between epistemology in the Hegelian sense and identity in a Hegelian sense. We become a kind of person based on the modes of thought that we exercise more or less than the other. You know what I mean? The balance that we strike changes our personality uh, through the exercise of it. And this is something that uh, Kierkegaard built on tremendously in his work. Uh, Kierkegaard's model of uh, the erotic and the poetic personalities at the aesthetic level, and then the development of the ethical personality, and then under Kierkegaard's model, then the religious personality, he's describing different modes of character. What kind of what kind of person do you become based on the ways that you conceive of the world and look at it? And that that character then changes your behavior, the kind of character you have. This goes all the way back to the Greeks. Heraclitus used to write about this. Heraclitus wrote ethos anthropoi daimon, uh, which is usually translated as character is fate which is a reasonable first approximation in which he's saying that how you're gonna end up depends upon your character to a large extent. I mean, yes, the external world you know, is gonna bring whatever it's gonna bring, good things, bad things, what have you. But what you do in response to the external world is largely based upon your character and your character operates upon you um, like a rider on a horse where they have so much empathy that the horse forgets the riders even there and the horse feels the subtlest of nudges from the rider and starts to believe that there is no rider, that they themselves felt like going that direction so that they don't know there's a rider there. Ethos Anthropoi Daimon actually says that a person's character is their guardian divinity, it's their daimon, which the Greeks believed rode your back and, and rode you in that way that we're talking about riders and horses riding you. It, it's, it's the origin of the expression, you know, when somebody has an addiction, they say you have a monkey on your back. They say, they mean a monkey instead of a god. You would like to have you know, something sacred and wise on your back guiding you, but instead you've got an ape and it's, it's leading you into, into, into problems. The, the Greeks had these ideas of eudaimonia and dysdaimonia as being, you know, if you're, if you're born lucky, you've got a daimon, a character that points you in the right directions to get you started in life, to begin building a, a personality from. But if you're unlucky, you, you, you have a dysdaimon and the dysdaimon is leading you astray out of the gate. And now it's gonna be harder for you. It's not impossible, but it's harder for you to become a good person because you have to overcome what you were born with in order to develop to the same level. So all of these ideas um, are taken up into Hegel. Now Hegel said there wasn't a single proposition of Heraclitus's that he didn't make central to his own philosophy. And it's taken up again by Kierkegaard. So part of what he's exploring is this idea that um, corresponding to the three faculties of the mind, the two basal metabolic faculties and the one mature faculty that we're supposed to grow into, that there are three character types in human beings based upon if you predominantly use that faculty to define how you interact with the world, it's gonna develop your character in a certain stereotypical direction. And so people, you know, although there's an infinite variety of people that these things act like gravity wells or strange attractors um, so that people tend to cluster statistically around one of three different approaches to the world and one of three different approaches to seeing life. And these three are motivated in very different ways. Um, when Freud developed his theory of the id, ego, and superego, it was his Victorian steam engine approach to represent, to trying to represent these ideas from, from, uh, from the Greeks. And he didn't really do it effectively. But the general idea is that um, there are three basic character types. There is a doulos, which is somebody who is um, highly driven by the experiential side of life. They have underdeveloped the intellectual rational side of their life. And so they're very much impulsive and driven by desires. Um, and that the thing about the doulos is that the possibilities for gnosis to, to lift them up to a more elevated, educated state is hampered by their underdevelopment of the rational side of their mind. And so they're only able to go so far. They, they end up living lives really driven by their desires. Um, and 
that we could see a lot of people who live their lives this way, for whom everything is a transaction involving consumer goods, everything is evaluated based on how they personally feel about it, um, they are hard to dissuade, they're hard to convince of anything other than what they already think, and what they think is mostly just keep circling around to I like it or I don't like it, it pleases me or it doesn't please me, sort of placida level of existence. Um, the second level of personality is also based upon a basal metabolic function. Um, this, this level of personality is um, the banausos. And the banausos um, becomes infatuated with reason and logic and systems of rules. Um, and so they like to be involved in crafts where there's training that you go through and you, you have levels that you can rise up through, you know, better or worse, you know where you are on the career ladder. They like to be involved in law because laws involve, you know, discrete rules that you put together for what you do and what you don't do. Uh, they might like to be involved in economics because money is very discrete. You either have it or you don't. And if you have it, you have a certain set amount and you should be increasing it and not decreasing it. All these rule-based schemas are, are attract Benausoi. Um, because it allows them to exercise um, the uh, what 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 Hegel calls the Verstand, the, the the finitized logical side of the mind, and so as a result, when they're setting out to make a society or to make decisions, they do it very differently than the way that the Duloy do, because the Duloy are doing it based on you know do I like it or not, how do I feel about it, you know, in, in an appetitive way. Whereas the Banausoi are doing it in a way that's very alienated from their feelings and their experiences and really driven by the systems of rules that they've learned. And this is one of the ways in which you get somebody like an Eichmann who doesn't even know what he feels about things, what he's just so focused on optimizing and making things efficient and getting the rules right Hello. that uh, Hello, he completely loses track of whether he should be doing the things that he's doing. Uh, it's, it's, he's, he's, he's lost in a world of abstractions and rules. So the Greeks believed there was a third character type, and it was based upon what happens if you can uncoil the finitized versions of these two basal metabolic functions and get them to infinitize, get them able to think of a world beyond your feelings, uh, to have an experiential relationship with the world that's not limited to your personal experiences, where you can buy the idea that the experiential world is infinite and goes beyond you and that it opens up your sense of wonder and possibilities. And likewise, on the rationalized, intellectualized side, to again, stop being so obsessed with the systems we already have, and to be able to think about other systems that we don't have, that there's other ways to look at the world. You don't have to be trapped in one of them. And that one of the things that you need in order to evaluate them is that experiential side of life that you've been cut off from. And when you put these pieces together, what you get is Vernunft, uh, according to Hegel, which is the adult mode that homo sapiens is supposed to develop into in our lives. And if you engage in Vernunft as your primary mode of thought, or as often as you can, you gradually develop into being the third character type, which is an Aristos. And, and Aristoi are more concerned with um, trying to figure out what the core principles are we should be living by, and what are the main problems in society that need to be fixed? What are the rules that need to be changed? Where, where are we headed in the wrong directions? They're sort of like the editors, correctors, whatever, of culture uh, in, a, in a properly functioning culture. We don't have any Aristoi in the modern world. Uh, we've basically exterminated them in order to create a more stable society. What we have is a very Banausic society. It's run by Banausoi, but it's mostly populated by Duloi. Large numbers of consumers and workers who are very powerless, who pretty much just have to do what they're told, and then a smaller number of intellectual functionaries who put together the systems of rules and laws and run the banks and, and so forth. And in this, in this, there is no place for Aristoi. Aristoi would be a disruptive influence because they'd be looking around going, you know, maybe we shouldn't, maybe, maybe it should be easier for people to get homes. Maybe you shouldn't have to go into debt for the rest of your life just to get an education. Maybe healthcare should be a right. Now they start questioning these things that, that disrupt, you know, the, 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 the vested interests that Banausoi have. And so they, they, they eliminate them. They, they try to make sure that your education doesn't result in anybody developing into becoming an Aristos. So... These are the, in a, in, a, in a real rough sketch, these are the basic three character types. And I think what Hegel and Kenneth Smith, Hannah Arendt gets into this as well. I think what they would all agree is that nobody's saying these are the only three types that are possible. We're just saying that these are the ones that are most directly suggested by the structure of the mind and how we think and how it works. Um, and that 
if there were a lot of Aristoi, maybe a new dialectic would result in the development of some fourth character type. We don't know. But because we don't have a critical mass of them, we can't find out. It's, we just don't have the circumstances for them to arise if, the, if there is such a thing. So that's, that's a sketch. Great. Uh, yeah, that's really fascinating because it uh, goes along with, uh, you know, nuance a lot. Uh, it's, uh, to me, it's more like young, you know, individuation, like people uh, over-functioning with their uh, left brain and their right brain and uh, both uh, left and right brain. And yeah, so I, I think the problem is, of course, we would like to, um, you know, uh, have more individualized world leaders, you know? Yes. But uh, do you think it's the systematic thinking they don't have? Because once you're individualized, you are the world. Like they don't need, or they don't have any desire for, you know, ru ruling or, you know, dominating. So, you know, we, we could do a whole two hour session just uh, on free will determinism, you know, all this stuff in, in Kenneth Smith. It's, it's a really deep and interesting subject uh, that's, that, you're, that you're touching on here. Uh, yeah, uh, okay, uh, I will shut up and yeah. No, no, I, I wish that we had more time because it's, uh, it's- Yeah, a, I know, I know, yeah, I would like- work. Yeah, I just really like what you have talked about, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Okay, Phil, it's your go. Yeah, it seems to me that that we live in a world that we want to experience, but we also are very dependent on civilization and culture. And it seems to me culture does depend, at least in some sort of system, maybe something that's less permanent and sort of so immovable, but we have traditions. So even if you look at sci scientists, science, it just seems to me there are, there are different kinds of science that evolve finally into that downgrade back into technology. I mean, the really sort of exceptional scientists actually do think in a inceptual way. In other words, they do connect with right. the world as it is. Right. But then you degenerate into a thing in which you, you know, the lesser scientists are more operating within a systemic mode. Okay, this is what the structure is, you know, like let's just try to refine it and then finally you get into engineering, which is something that in a sense, the builders, you know, whether you want to talk about, you know, <laughs> the masons or, or the or the modern engineering, the builders, and they're, they're needed to build a structured society. And it seems to me it's hard to blend those and it's necessary, but it's hard to build those. As an example, I'm an artist and I know that we have built this tradition of the frame of reference mm -hmm. in art. It happens to be the rectangle. <laughs> so in a sense, the Cubists were very cl clever in a sense, break up the rectangle internally, but it finally degenerates back into uh, a sort of pure structure like Mondrian was, okay? Right. So in right. some sense, and then, you know, I remember one day I, I was drawing and, and I, I'm thinking like, okay, I, I'm drawing something and I say, now I get to the edge, but I wanna get out of the edge. <laughs> yeah. Get out of the boundary. So, you know, so I added a piece of paper that extended it and okay. And then if I look, once I look at that, it's like, it's hard to even judge what it is. And then, and then I decided, okay, if I'm going to go with this, then I'll build, uh, put another piece of paper that could expand the boundaries and so forth. And so forth. It's just the problem is that then it doesn't get into a kind of systematic structure, which other people could uh, sort of appreciate except a few and even then it's sort of temporary within a structure of our understanding and so therefore in a sense you almost are reduced to this dependency that you know a, a, a system has to develop but it takes a long time uh, and, and to and because you have to have a tradition and balance to invention you know or discovery in order mm -hmm. to build a society. You just can't have a society 
uh, one day you discover one thing, another day you discover, uh, then you, you don't know what the thing is because you have no way of judging it. So I wonder whether that is not deep down part of a human nature. And that's why I'm saying, you know, splitting the stone, you know, you found it, <laughs> you found the structure, you know, it almost begins to be something, okay, you could depend. It's like, it actually is almost, it almost as if engineering on the basic level, it's the structure that builds society, you know, it all, certainly it extends all the way back to Egypt, you know, yeah. you know, and you, you have, uh, you know, you have the God, you know, Osiris who governs life. And then you have Seth who builds things out of measurements and so forth. So, I mean, that tradition has been around. We, we have hardened it more and more. So we're more reliant on it. And even if you go back to China, you know, Confucianism built a system <laughs> in which creates a certain kind of harmony because everybody now know what it is the certain rituals right. and all that kind of stuff. So I think <clears throat> that the problem is that how much do you depend on something that's that's always shifting to, to, to discovery and how much do you have to rely on a certain tra tradition to make us feel like, oh, I get it. I feel comfortable within that system. I understand how to operate. What if you have traffic lights every day it turns into a different color? Like, right, right, right. like you know, like that would be liberating, but on the other hand, it would be very confusing. So yes. I, I just wonder whether we haven't built this structure just out of not only, not necessarily in a diabolical way, but it's just like that is our nature because we, we have to evolve into a civilization. And, yeah. and as, as such, you know, and then once you build the system, there are always people who could play the system and then you get into this whole thing. So I just think I'm not about, as much as I am sort of like more of a progressive person that want to think for myself, I am not about the abandoned systems altogether. It's just right, a matter of, of like putting in the right place so it loosens up, it doesn't freeze into a structure that you can never move away from. That, yeah, that's that, right. That seems to be the thing. That's right. Yeah, I mean, really, it's not. It's not like we can do without the noetic side of of our mind, right? We need it, and we we need the systems that they can promulgate. But the but the key is, of course, we want that to be our servant, not our master. Yeah. It makes a great servant. Then it makes a terrible master. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Okay, Stephen, it's your go now. Yeah, yeah. Well, we get the, uh, the the poor old Nazis have been held up eternally in the modern era as a black card. I mean, you've got a lot of black cards in history, but the poor poor Nazis yeah. have really drawn the short store, sh short straw, and they've been held up as a bad example all the time. And really, this is just what Kenneth Smith was pointing out was modernistic vanity. Yes and refusing to face reality. We believe yes. we can hold up the Nazi as a black card and say, well, I'm not like that. I'm a slightly uh, lighter shade of gray than the Nazi, right. therefore I'm good. Yes. It's a Nazi who can become the emotional bucket for all You're right. the evil. I think one of the, you know, there's been some poetic moments in the media, which has uh, brought things to light. I always think of uh, Mr. Spock looking at the alternate universe of the fascist federation and saying, hmm, now that was a homo sapiens I could really admire. Yes, yes, everyone forgets his moment of admiration. Perfectly logical, Captain. <laughs> and they're all looking at him like, are you insane? <laughs> yeah, I, I, my favorite bit was out of a movie called The Keep, which had the good Nazi and the bad Nazi, and Jürgen uh, Prochnow is playing the good Nazi. It's, it's horrified at the poor innocent villagers being shot up by the, the bad Nazi, beautifully uh, pro uh, uh, portrayed by Gabriel Byrne. I mean, Gabriel Byrne just played the most beautiful Nazi I've ever seen. And the, the, he was the, so evil. Well, the... the, the the thing was, he was just purely rational. He didn't react yeah. emotionally. 
Yes. Everything was for a purpose. That's right. And then as he That's says right. to Jurgen, he says, you despise our ruthlessness, but you do not grab history by the throat and write the next 1,000 year future without brutality and courage. A so pseudo Hegelian, this is the whole point, the fascists came into existence purely to fight the Bolsheviks when I explored their history. And they suddenly discovered that they didn't have an ideology beyond that. They had to actually go and write their ideology after they came into existence. And just right. like the Marxists, they drew on pseudo Hegelianism that we're progress. We're going to build the new world order. And yet, unfortunately, there'll be a bit of suffering and things smashed up along the way. But yes. in the long run, it'll all be worth it. Now, you can't sell me that on, on, on all that because yeah. I just simply don't believe in progress. To me, progress was some faulty idea <clears throat> that showed up in the, the 18th century and probably got a bit too expanded on by Hegel. I, I don't know. He, I think he saw the dark side of his ideas, but others didn't. They just yeah. picked up on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. We're going to have to smash a few heads but will create the perfect mechanical order. The perfect mechanical order. Yeah, you know, for those in the chat who aren't following why Stephen is saying poor Nazis, what, he doesn't mean that Nazis are great and we should all be Nazis. What he means is whenever we're trying to pick out an example of modernism behaving badly, we always pick the Nazis. And, and really what that, the downside of doing, the upside of doing that is that people start by agreeing that it's bad and then they, you can use it to, explore the example with and what it means. The downside is it sort of excuses everything else and makes it seem like everything else must not be so bad. And, and as Stephen's absolutely right, that is a very dangerous line to go down. We forget things like, where did the Nazis get the idea of the concentration camps? Well, they came to the United States and they looked at Indian reservations and they said, wow, you did a great job of destroying this entire civilization. I wish we could be like you. You know, there's this level in which Hitler's concentration camps were his ode to America. And we don't like to talk about that. I mean, that makes us very uncomfortable in this country. And so what we do is we demonize the Nazis and put all the bad into them so that we don't ever have to talk about the things that we've done that were pretty crappy and shitty. Uh, and you know, part of where it gets, you know, one of the things that Stephen emphasizes in these talks is the way that, you know, totalitarian ideals, the goal of creating a perfect machine order goes well beyond any one side of the political spectrum. Uh, you, you know, plenty of societies in the modern order attempt to over mechanize everything. And in fact, it's hard to find uh, a modern nation that isn't fundamentally trying in one way or another to create the good life through mechanization. If, if only there's enough rules, and if everybody just mindlessly follows all the rules, maybe we could make a perfect world. And there is a, all of these things are part of the same family of cultures. We can micromanage the perfect world. Exactly, exactly. So that's what he means by poor Nazis. <laughs> he doesn't mean the Nazis are good guys. He means we're really scapegoating the Nazis for a lot of things that the rest of us should be taking responsibility for as well. Uh, so. Okay, Leon, it's your go. Hi, Leon. You got your mute on there. Leon. Okay. He may have stepped away. Oh, well. Yes, maybe. Oh, we've got uh, Bryce is waving his hand. Yes. Um, just quickly, I, I'd love if you could give reference to the Native Americans and, Hit, and Hitler, uh, where I could find that. Also, you mentioned the basal metabolic thing. Um, you're talking a little bit about Hegel and the, the different person, or actually, no, like uh, before that with the different personalities. Where can I also find out? Could, could you reference both of those for me, please? Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's hard to read Hegel in English. Um, he says these things, but by the time they've been translated into English, you're reading sentences where he's talking about, you know, the notion has the concrete particular, 
but the idea has the abstract universal and the abstract keeps us away from the idea. And by the time you're done with the sentence, you have no idea what he's talking about. And if you could have read it in German, it all would have made perfect sense. But in English, you're like, these words can't be bent that far to mean whatever it is he's trying to say with them. So really what you need is you need somebody who really understands Hegel to do a course or write a book that goes into what is Hegel trying to say in this work. And what he's trying to say is that, you know, Begriff, which is the kind of the right brain basal metabolic function that has to do with experiencing life and experiencing feelings and sensations, that it has the great strength that it's very concrete. It's, it's tied to what's actually going on around you more than the other basal metabolic function, the abstract intellectualization. That, you know, a baby, you poke a baby with a pin and the baby's gonna cry, right? The baby is directly connected to its experience of life. It's not like lost theorizing about, you know, some science fiction world that it's trying to invent. It's right here, right now. It's, it's, it's plugged in. And that isn't just a mode of thought because it so profoundly affects your experience of life. It becomes a mode of personality, right? The way that you make decisions is different when you're deeply plugged into the world and your feelings than it is when you can get lost in ideas and abstractions and systems. You know, if you spend all your time, like I'm a programmer, I program for a living and programming is a very abstract activity, right? I can spend hour after hour tuning up my, my algorithms and getting my metaphors right and deciding if I need a different abstraction. And I look up and I realize I forgot to eat breakfast. So it's so disconnected from my own experience of life that I'm not taking care of my own basic needs. Um, Gulliver's Travels has, a, has a, an episode where Gulliver goes to a, an island full of philosophers and they have special people called flappers who attend each philosopher and have to slap them around a bit whenever they get so lost in abstraction that they forget where they are. They need to be reminded, oh yes, I'm a person, I have a body. Oh yeah, I should take care of that. So Hegel talks about these things when he's, when he's talking about these modes of thought. He talks about the ways that it changes your perception of, of yourself and your life and the world. And that from that, you can then you know, infer that it's gonna derive a whole personality out of that. Does he go into it a little bit like, I know Nietzsche uh, mentions kind of different cultures having different types of arts um, yes. and, and, and ideas because of the metabolic aspect of that, that yes. culture. Yeah, the, the way to think about it is that um, Hegel's triad of concrete but parochial begriff, right, is, is what we're born into. And by our dissatisfactions with that life, you know, when you're a baby, you're pooping yourself and you're like, you know what, what if I didn't poop myself? Or what if I could learn to, you know, get my own food and I wouldn't have to be hungry? So you start to distance yourself and make plans and abstract and predict about the world and, and, and look forward to the future. And that develops the second basal metabolic function, which he calls Verstand, which is the abstracting intellectualizing function. And it, it has the power of, of universalizing. It can be, go beyond your immediate experience, but it does it at the price of losing touch with all the rich, juicy details of life and feelings. So you become abstracted from yourself. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's the model that he has for Verstand. Is it's, a, it's an abstract universal. And he says, the thing that we need to achieve as an adult is to put the two strengths together, in, in, not in a balance, or, in, or, in a, or in a, you know, somewhere in between, it's not a compromise. You're looking for a third mode of thought that brings the concrete richness of the griff together with the universalizing capabilities of Verstand to, to achieve what he calls the concrete universal. And that's where you can think about the world on a large scale without losing track of the fact that things are real and people have feelings and there's actual, you know, things matter. They're not just theoretical. You know, this, this, this ability to stay plugged into the world while also looking beyond your immediate experience is the, is the adult mode of life that he's, that he's proposing. So Kierkegaard goes into that a whole bunch more uh, in his, in, in either or, for example, uh, and, and, and some of his other books. But so does Kenneth Smith. He, he, he writes about this. One, one philosopher you could read to look at these um, three modes is if you read Hannah Arendt's book, The Human Condition, she talks about the three modes of life in Greek culture, the home, which is the oikos, 
uh, the marketplace, which is the Agora, and then um, the actual place where political decisions are made. And she talks about the way these correspond to different personalities and different castes in Greek civilization. This is the same triad. Um, in a, in, you know, at a different scale of organization that Hegel's talking about. These are the same ones that um, Kierkegaard and Smith are talking about. And, you know, when, when, when you read Nietzsche, he doesn't usually break it into three this way. He breaks it into two. And the two he's breaking it into um, are the Dionysian, which you might think of as Gnosis. Uh, and Gnosis is what unites the Griffin Vernunft. Both the, both the infantile form and the mature form both have that quality of being plugged into the world and being able to, to experience things deeply, right? That's Gnosis, that's the Dionysianism that he's talking about. And then he contrasts that with, the, with what he calls the Apollinean, uh, you know, the Apollo side, which is, which is the abstract capabilities. And the Apollonian corresponds to the Greek um, faculty noesis. So if you think of the two sides of the brain as being Gnosis and noesis, and in their infantilized forms and their finitizing forms, they produce the first two modes of thought and personalities that Hegel's talking about. The begriff, which is gnosis when it's curled in on itself and limited to its own experience. And then likewise, the verstand, which is the abstract capabilities of, of logic, but again, turned back in on itself and trapped inside its own systems of thinking. And then, but the goal is to open those up, to infinitize them, to be able to do more than your parochial experience and your parochial systems. And that's what opens the way to, to, to Vernunft, the third mode of thought, which develops the third personality, which is where Gnosis and Noesis come together in a harmony. So that's the general framework. But yeah, the human condition, her, her, her stuff on the, on, the, um, on, on, the three, on the three parts of the Greek economy, is, it's a really good place to begin because she talks about why, the, why you experience the world differently in each of these three parts of life. If you don't mind, I, 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 I'm sorry, I don't wanna, I, I just saw someone else ask, uh, raise their hand. I was just, I, I saw that what you did with, from you know, the Greeks to Hegel, and then I know Freud studied Schopenhauer too, and a lot of that um, is where he got the unconscious from. And right. it, it just, uh, yeah, it really, those dyads of the conscious and unconscious, it just seems like came largely from the German philosophers. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's what's so interesting is that some of these lines of development of thinking, they go back thousands of years, and sometimes there are gaps of thousands of years before anybody makes an advance. You know, Hegel said that nobody had probed into this stuff as deeply as Heraclitus. And it was hard to think about the fact that there had been 2000 years of philosophy in which people sort of left Heraclitus and his in insights behind and went wandering around on other things, you know, like how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, which turns out to be an interesting question if you're, if you're a medieval theologian. But, you know, there are so many blind alleys to go down that you can lose track of whole lines of development of understanding of human nature and history and you can lose them for thousands of years, but then eventually somebody picks it up again and goes, hey, wait, this was important. I wanna, I wanna take this further and systematize it, and make sense out of it. So yeah, these, 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 these relationships between these thinkers over time are very interesting. Thanks for bringing that up, Bryce. Let's try to see if Leon is there. Leon, your turn. There's a space calling Leon. <laughs> it looks like he's not. Okay, Farley, it's your go. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, thanks, Rick. Uh, yeah, it's again uh, super interesting what you just said. Uh, yeah, I just want to uh, ask you mentioned do you have some sort of uh, discussion group or something like that, an event? Yes. Do you do streaming or something like that? Because it's yes. so interesting. It's yeah, David Roll records them all and posts them on YouTube. It's at 4 a.m. in your time in Melbourne. <laughs> uh, 5 a.m. now Set with the alarm. daylight saving. Uh, yeah, could, you, could you uh, share the uh, YouTube and the name of the YouTube channel, please? David, can you post that link? I think, I think he's I'm doing on it. it. Great, great, yeah. 
Yeah, we, we, uh, we spent 37 weeks going through a book we're putting together of essays called Mythos and Logos by Kenneth Smith, which is exploring the idea that there are two fundamentally different modes of culture. Um, and we're really not aware of myth, of mythos culture and what it's like, because we've gone so far the other way into logos culture, that it's almost inconceivable for us. And so it's sort of that series of lectures sort of explored, well, what was mythos culture? What would it look like? And what would it mean to try to bring it back into the world again? You know, how would we use it? We, we, what we've moved on to now is we're going through uh, his column, Millennia in Microcosm, which explores kind of the three great epochs of Western civilization and how they compare and contrast with each other. We just got started. This Monday was our very first session. Uh, so, yay. <laughs> so there'll be plenty more and they'll, they'll be up on uh, David Roll's page. And if anybody, you know, were to start putting comments on those YouTube channels, uh, I'd watch for it and, and, and respond. So even if we're out of sync with each other because we're in different time zones, that would give us a way to, to have a dialogue about it. Great. <laughs> okay, Stephen, your go. Ground control to Major Leon, is he there? Not yet. Oh, okay, I was just gonna say, yeah, all the, I think the Iran, uh, this sort of Iran sort of point with uh, Eichmann was people for Eichmann, you know, he's got horns out of his heads, he's got the hooven uh, uh, feet and the, uh, the tail, and he's gonna walk in like into the courtroom, like a devil, and uh, right. Iran's point is, there's just a banal side here. He was just a guy working for a corporation. Yeah, That was his goal in life. He was going yeah. to get there, do his job very well. And he was beautiful at convincing himself in his boss's philosophy, even though he didn't have any of his own. Right. So he was just there trying to be the perfect manager. And they're, they're all around us today as well. Yes. But this this strange quality, this is what was alluded to here, of demonizing the other. Yes. When we feel we don't agree with them, rather right. than looking at them more objectively. But this right. is all the time. They keep on doing it all the time. Donald Trump, demonized to the nth degree. Demonizing is what we do. Scapegoating is what we do. And, and as with Eichmann, part of the reason we do it is to avoid thinking, right? We don't want, you know, Hannah Arendt flat out said, the alarming thing about Eichmann is how normal he is. And as she looks around in the 1960s at, at people in New York and elsewhere and says, you know, a lot of you are just exactly like Eichmann. And if the circumstances were different, you would be the ones causing enormous numbers of deaths. And doing the whole thing very calmly, just you know, because it's your job requirements and you want to get a good rating from your from your boss, and you're you're not you're not full of rage and hate. You're not you're not frothing at the mouth. You're not a demon worshiper. You're just a normal person doing a normal job. And she says, "What does it say about the modern world that we've normalized the kind of personality required to commit atrocities? We've we've made atrocities domesticated and industrialized." And, and so neutral that almost anybody could do it. Uh, and she says, that's the important takeaway. But of course, even though she says that, immediately everybody turns around and starts demonizing the Nazis as though they had to be monsters to do what they did. And the whole reason to do that is to avoid learning the lesson that Hannah Arendt is trying to teach us, which is that, oh no, it doesn't take monsters anymore. It's perfectly normal people are capable of terrifying things. And we ought to do something about that. Okay, Leon, I think you're there now. Your yeah, turn. I saw his hand went up. You there, have, Leon? You'll have to unmute yourself, Leon. Yeah, you're, you're still there on mute. No, maybe Leon's having problems with his uh, computer. Yeah. Yeah, I can see Bryce is waving his hand again. Can you hear me now? Yes, oh, Leon. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Oh, finally, finally, something, <laughs> something is not right tonight. First of all, the volume is very low, and uh, and when I try to check on chat, 
it, it keeps flowing in and out. But anyway, ah. hello, Rick. Hello, yeah. Leon. Uh, uh, it is common belief that the three primary pursuits of our human race are the pursuit of truth, goodness, and the beauty. Now, to my mind, these pursuits provide the primary source of our happiness. What are Kenneth Smith's thoughts on happiness, please? Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Well, that's a complicated topic. I mean, the, my first reaction is that particular triad you're listing, that sounds like Aristotle. Uh, I, think, I think he says words very much to that effect um, when he's talking about, you know, all, all things that people do are to the end of some good that we're trying to achieve. And, you know, one of the ways to evaluate how well we achieve it is, is the result beautiful? You know, the, 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 you know he's, he's, he talks about the pursuit of the beautiful. And of course, he talks about the truth as a prerequisite for all of this. So, uh, you know, when you, when you ask Kenneth Smith questions like this, you, you, you're more likely than not to get an answer where instead he's going to try to channel some different perspective from some other philosopher. Because part of what he likes to do is say, well, what did Kant think? is the answer to your question. What did Hannah Arendt think was the answer to your question? What would Nietzsche think is the answer to your question? And he wants to sort of offer you opportunities. And then the other thing that he's gonna do is then talk about what are the ways in which happiness can be a fool's gold in which if you get it indirectly as a result of pursuing virtues, it can be enduring. But if you try to get it directly, it may entirely collapse. Uh, that that happiness is one of those things that works best not as a goal but as a consequence uh, of goals. Um, the Greeks talk about that a lot, uh, so I, I suspect that would be where Kenneth Smith would come at this from. He'd say, you know, you want to you want to develop yourself as a person. You want to you want to try to you know develop your perspectives on the world. You want to try to develop your understanding of yourself and your your place in the world and what you can contribute you want to try to you know live a meaningful life and if you do those things as a side effect of that work you know sometimes you're going to be happy sometimes you won't but you know at least you'll have the the other good things that came from from what you were pursuing you know you have the the maturity and the and the perspective and and so forth um, he has a parable where he says people mistake the god's bounty of wisdom for a recipe for happiness. And he says, you know, it only leads to happiness sometimes, but it will lead to wisdom. <laughs> wisdom is good whether you're happy or unhappy. And sometimes with more wisdom, you can manage to avoid self-sabotaging as often, you know, so you get rid of some of the unnecessary unhappiness and you're left with the sort of inevitable unhappiness. So a complicated answer to a straightforward question, but uh, that's kind of his way. Okay, Bryce, your turn now. Um, I just kind of a personal question, uh, Rick. I was just kind of wondering um, how you became so passionate about uh, Smith's philosophies and if there were any particular ones that you have found of really uh, inspired you like in a personal way that you want to share? Oh boy. So um, I've been into philosophy since I was a little kid. Um, my mom was a hippie and my dad was a, you know, sort of civil rights activist. So I was sort of surrounded by, shall we say, countercultural thinkers. The cultural criticism is sort of the waters I swam in as a little kid. Um, and, you know, wanting to be good was something I wanted since I was little. I was one of those little nerdy boys who wanted to be a good boy. Uh, you know, I, I didn't want to be a cool kid. I wanted to be a good boy. And uh, part of what that meant was then I became very interested in studying, you know, studied the Holocaust when I was, you know, 11. I studied Socrates and these guys when I was young. I, was, I, I got hooked on it. And so it was natural for me when I accidentally stumbled across his column in the comics journal to go, hey, it's a philosopher. I like philosophers. I should read this guy and see what I think. And at first, I had the same reaction everybody does when they read his long form stuff, which is, ah, why is, this, why is he using all these long words? 
Why can't he just say what he means? Why is he so negative? Why is he criticizing all these things? I, I, for a while, I was, I was sort of kept him at arm's length, but I kept reading it because it was challenging. And I like reading things that challenge me. Um, I figured out that his vocabulary was better than mine, which was saying something because I prided myself on my vocabulary. Uh, you know, when you're when you're a smart guy surrounded by other 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 smart people, you know, you 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 sort of you get this self image of yourself and what your capabilities are. And, but I I was lucky because I grew up in traditional martial arts, uh, practicing Okinawan karate. And part of what that taught us is that what you want to be surrounded by is people who are better than you are. You want to be surrounded by people who have the same skills, but at a higher level so that you can study them and figure out, well, what are they doing that I don't know how to do yet? <clears throat> so when I figured out that his vocabulary was better than mine and that it was not gratuitous, but that he was actually using language in a more precise and more revelatory way than I was, that was the, that was the point when I called him up. Uh, I got his contact information. And, and, and called him up and I wanted to talk to him about, so why, you know, what are you doing here? How did you get involved in this? Um, and the thing that cemented it for me was discovering the way that he's not a philosopher who keeps pointing back to himself. He's a philosopher who keeps pointing to other philosophers and other writers and other artists and so forth. And so it makes him, it, it makes him a convenient, catalyst for pursuing my philosophical education. You know, in preparation for tonight's presentation, you know, I've been working on this all week and it made me go back and reread a whole bunch of the philosophers that I thought I'd already, you know, experienced enough to have an idea of what they thought. Even the people where I thought I knew their writing very well, I was surprised by some of the things that I discovered. Um, I don't know how I missed Hannah Arendt's statement in Eichmann in Jerusalem in the, in the 1963 New Yorker article series when she says, no one has the right to obey, period. No one has the right to obey. That is such a potent formulation of what was wrong with the Nazi regime. And it's the sort of thing as a fan of Hannah Arendt's work, I would have thought that I'd been exposed to, but I, my approach to her had somehow, I'd somehow missed it. But because I was going back through Kenneth Smith's work and because he keeps pointing out to these other philosophers, it made me go back and revisit her when I wouldn't have otherwise done so. And then I stumble across this just nugget of pure gold. Uh, I think this is the thing I like best about Kenneth Smith's writing is that he's constantly stimulating me to expand my education. Um, and I love that. So that's that's what I'm into. Now, it's not like hero worship or anything like that, or putting him on an idol. He's he got plenty of flaws. He's a he's a person. Uh, there 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 are things that I know more about than he knows about. Um, but overall, his philosophical and sociological um, breadth of experience is a lot bigger than mine, and uh, that makes it fun as a as a place for me to learn. So I don't know if that fully answers your question, but. Oh no, that was uh, brilliant. Thank you. I, I, uh, it's really inspiring to me just to for you to share that. So thank you for sharing that, Rick. All right, sure. Okay, Stephen, you're on again. Yeah, I was going to bring up uh, Nietzsche's point. Well, I had brought up this one prior with Rick, and that is the moderns have uh, uh, failed to see something that Nietzsche saw when he talks about the madman, when the madman comes up to the crowd yes, and says, well, you've killed God. You realise what's happening. The, mad, mad, uh, the crowd goes, yeah, so what? God's gone. Big deal. But, and Nietzsche's making out the point that their whole world outlook was built upon that Christian tradition. And he, one of his big reasons for that was that if there was some all-powerful God up there, he created my reason. And I do have a path of progress. Sure, there's hurdles. Sure, there's sin. Sure, there's a devil. But if I persevere and am honest, I have a good chance of reaching heaven, something like that. Even my mind could take me there. There's a heaven in my mind, even, because a good, a good God wouldn't have created a reason 
which was there to trick me, which was there to tear me down. But then if we're throwing God out of the picture and we are just an evolutionary accident, how do we know our reason that machine evolution is designed for us hasn't got holes in it? Right. How does it, how do I know that I, the individual, ultimately has some sort of a good end with reason? And why do the moderns always suppose this? Why have the moderns carried forth the prejudices that were in Christianity? And I would accuse the humanists of this, that you're just plain the same. Why are you preaching Christianity, I would say, to the humanists? You've merely thrown the meat, Jesus, out of the pot, and you've got this consomme you call humanism, which, as Nietzsche pointed out, was just Christianity light. Where are we going to go? How can we be so sure of ourselves when we're just accidents? How can the humanists and the rationalists be so sure of our fate when our reason and our mind is just a historical accident? Yeah, he's... Uh... Nietzsche, I think part of the reason why people like to stereotype and demonize Nietzsche is because if they don't, they might have to take seriously some of these very difficult <laughs> questions. It's really uncomfortable, right? Because he, he had an instinct for where are the soft, unexamined parts of our culture that we really long since should have taken a closer look at. And he, and he says and he raises them in such a way that you can't ignore them and also you're not comfortable doing it at the same time. <clears throat> So, okay, Bali, it's your go. Uh, yeah, uh, that's a very interesting question from Stephen. Uh, I, I, I have another two questions. One is about, yeah, well, one is about you. Um, do you find doing your, I don't know, your daily job programming, uh, maybe, you know, software engineering, do you find, do you think it's creative work? Do you find that creativity in your work? Do you find pleasure out of it? Or is it why you are so interested in philosophy because you want to have this kind of uh, right brain experience? And my yeah. second question is, uh, mm -hmm. I saw uh, in your slides that uh, he's also preparing this book called Unknow Thyself. Yes. This is such a cliche. I mean, this topic has been, you know, talked about millions of times already. What yes. kind of new, what, what flavor he's adding to this topic? Yes. Okay, so let's tackle those one at a time. So um, yes, programming is an extremely left-brained activity, but what I do is medical programming uh, and you can't afford to screw it up because if you fail to say that somebody's allergic to something, then they might be given it in the hospital and it could hurt them or kill them. And if you fail to notice a drug-drug interaction, then somebody could be prescribed something that they shouldn't take because of what they're already taking. There's all these opportunities to go wrong. And what it does is it makes the programming matter in a empirical real world way. <clears throat> also, the programming is on a subject that's so complex that uh, medicine itself has to be divided into an enormous number of specialties. There's nobody who knows all of medicine or even most of medicine or even all of a single discipline of medicine. So it requires a vast community of experts to work well together uh, to be able to tell us about you know, what it takes to take care of a patient and what are the sorts of things that the program has to watch out for. As a result, it's not something you can just sit down and do by design. It's too complicated. The only way it can be done is incrementally. You, you, you make it a little bit better and you take it back to the users and they try it out and they give you feedback and you make it a little bit better. So there's a huge feedback loop that's been going on in the software we're working on for 45 years. Um, and it means that it has that empirical side, the experiential side is what drives the whole thing. That's, that's the beating heart of the whole software life cycle for what we do. And the thing that I do these days is less of the programming and more of teaching people 
how to listen to the users, how to draw them into the experience so that they can be steering the whole process, how to be experience driven rather than design driven. I'm trying to teach people to do less left brain programming and more right brain programming to, to bring the two halves together. So it turns out uh, it's actually very quick to write. Uh, so, um, but, you know, the thing that I always really wanted to do was teach. If the United States wasn't so mean to its teachers, I would have become a teacher. Uh, that's what I would have done. But when I found out sort of how underpaid they are and overworked and, you know, they're they're tied up in bureaucracies of requirements they're not allowed to teach the what they think is right they have to teach the curriculum that's been designed for them by angry school boards that fought over the politics of what they were allowed to teach it's it's like it's so fraught with peril that i realized i wouldn't be able to do it as a teacher so i teach in my programming job uh, and you know that's it's inevitable that i would end up at philosophical seminars like this for the reason you said because it does give me an opportunity to to do more right brain stuff, to augment it, to be more balanced. You're right. You're right. I, I put as much right brain as I can into the programming, but it's still it's still a left brain activity and I can't feel balanced that way. So good on you for noticing. Um, as far as know thyself, um, it's safe to say nobody writing on that subject today is going to write about it the way that Kenneth Smith would write about it because it's, it's easy, you know, the word no itself, you know, in English is so vague about, well, know how, what kind of knowing are we talking about? What is, what, what is the brain supposed to be engaged in? One of the things that's rarely discussed is that the Greeks had multiple words for knowledge and knowing, multiple verbs, and they meant specifically very different things. And they chose one. The, the Oracle at Delphi doesn't actually say know, know yourself. It says nothi say alton. Nothi is a derivative of the verb of, of gnosis. Uh, specifically, it's talking about experiential, deep experiential understanding, not analytical, intellectual, logical understanding. Uh, it didn't have to say that. They could have said the other kind, but they didn't. Uh, so the Oracle at Delphi is actually telling us to do something that doesn't translate into English very well. Uh, and that most people, when they talk about this, they miss. So what he's going to do in, this, in these essays is explore what would it mean to apply specifically gnosis, begriff, you know, vernunft, these, this, this right brain side kind of knowledge. Why would they be telling us to do that instead of the other? And what would we, what would we gain from that? So I think it'll be a unique take. Um, maybe people wrote about this in Greece and we just lost the essays, right? It's, it's possible that this has been written before, but I don't think anybody in the modern age would write it because we just don't have the language anymore to understand the distinctions they're trying to make. Okay, Dan, it's your turn. Hey, Hi, Dan. Great, as always. <laughs> good, good job. This is a, a great little micro class on Kenneth Smith. But something Thanks, that, that came up early on was uh, the idea of um, philosophy or philosophers providing solutions. And uh, yes. the more I think about it, I don't think any valid philosopher actually provides solutions. They just give you a better diagnostic toolkit and you pretty much have to uh, improvise your own solutions based on the, the tools that they're giving you. So it's it's not math. It's not something you can string together, you know, ideals and, and get them to balance on both sides of an equal sign or something like right. that. So, so any, would you say that any philosophy or philosopher that does appear to be giving out solutions is more likely to be some kind of, you know, crypto cultist or, you know, pseudo religion or, uh, uh, how do you, how does your bullshit detector uh, <laughs> work on that stuff? Well, I mean, I'd go back to the very first piece of Kenneth Smith I shared on the cover of the slide, which is where he says, you know, philosophy is either existentialist or escapist. Yeah. So if it's existentialist, you can't lay out recipes and algorithms and programs in advance. All you can do is, is invest in the maturation process and hope that that prepares you better for whatever crazy stuff the world is going to throw at you. Because what you, the thing that determines the difference between life and lifelessness is that life 
is sensitively acute to and responsive to the actual concrete conditions it finds itself in. It doesn't brainlessly act out a program regardless of which way it's facing or what's around it. Um, Christopher Alexander talks about this in his books on, on architecture. When he talks mm -hmm. about the difference between living architecture and dead architecture, he says, you know, dead architecture, they stamp out the same designs all the time, no matter where the house is. But in living architecture, you might move that window three feet to the left because from there you've got a view of the mountain, but from where you had left it, all you can see is the outhouse. You know, if you're, if you have to be, if you're going to respond to what's around you, be aware of it and sense it and then adapt to it to create a greater whole that requires that you not go in with too much programming. And it's part of why in Christopher Alexander's series of books, he, he, you know, he gives you these principles for living architecture, but then tells you that everyone should be different and that he can't tell you in advance what yours should look like. You have to have the people who are going to live there and the place where it's at all brought into focus to make, you know, the actual circumstances. And I'd say that's certainly the same. That's what Kenneth Smith would say about philosophy as well, that, you know, the people who say, I can tell you in advance how to live your life and all you have to do is follow these rules. That's, that's escapism. That's that noetic obsession with systems uh, and, and following the system regardless of whether it applies or not. It, the only way to, to be truly alive is for an existentialist is for is for a, a philosophy to let you be the judge to use your taste and discretion because you're the one who's actually going to be in the circumstances and having to make the decision no armchair quarterback whether a philosopher or anyone else can tell you in advance what your actual circumstances are going to be and they're what's going to drive everything one more question kind of out of left field maybe but uh did you ever read the because it Ted Kaczynski manifesto, uh, or not yet. Know, uh, where not it's, yet. It's pretty bleak. I mean, he kind of says, you know, it's too late. We've gone down this industrial pathway, and there's no turning around. And you know, he he doesn't even try to offer <laughs> solution. He just did what he did to get his manuscripts read, apparently. But I, you don't know of any interaction like if Kenneth Smith ever commented on uh, on the manifesto. I think or, he did. I think really? I think Kenneth Smith did write about about Ted Kaczynski. I have to go back to the mailing list and see. Uh, but um, you know, part of what he did was in that mailing list is respond to current events hmm. and hmm. Uh, and guess, write yeah, essays about anything and everything. Uh, and the Unabomber, you know, that's fair game, right? And if you're a philosopher and someone's uh, Unabombing in order to get you to read their manifesto, yeah. you better believe somebody <laughs> like Kenneth Smith's going to read that manifesto and have something to say about it. Uh, but you know, one of the fundamental things to say about it right off the bat is. Ted Kaczynski needed Kenneth Smith because mm. the thing that Kenneth Smith offers as a philosopher is this idea that modernism should not be believed when it tells you that it is the only way. Modernism should not be believed when it tells you that it defines the, the total possibilities of human experience. When, it, mm. when modernism says nothing could be better than this, this is as good as it's going to get. When modernism says, I'm omnipotent, I'm all powerful and I will last forever. I'm the end of history. Nothing will ever be different from this. You can't give into that and believe that it's propaganda. But because we're swimming in it all the time and because modernism flatters itself so relentlessly without, without any noticeable disagreement, it's really easy to slip into thinking that the limits and liabilities of the modern mind are the limits and liabilities of the human mind. And it's only when you do this kind of cross-cultural comparison where you learn to see other cultures not as primitive versions of yourself, but in their own terms, with their own world perspective, that you start to realize things don't have to be this way at all. In fact, for most of human existence, they weren't this way. There are other ways that we can interact with the world. You know, if, if modernism defined the limits of human existence, if we all behaved like this, we wouldn't have lasted 300,000 years before the rise of modernism. We would have used up all the resources at once because modernism has this drive, right, to go convert everything into cash. And so, but that didn't happen. 300,000 years went by and mostly things were fine. There were ups and downs. And yes, the, the, the end of the ice age took out a lot of animals, but it took them out everywhere, not just in some one place or wherever people were. So what we see is a world of fluctuation and change in which Homo sapiens was able to respond to all of that and keep itself in some kind of harmony until the rise of these new sort of carcinogenic 
colonizer cultures that have their own sort of imperative to convert everything into numbers. Well, the only saving grace of modernism is we might escape the next uh, extinction asteroid or something like that. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the only, uh, you know, upside, <laughs> literal well, upside. <laughs> you know, this this is what happens, right? If, if you're a culture critic and you criticize modernism, it sounds like we're saying that modernism is bad. And what we're really saying is that like every other stage of development, modernism has its bad qualities. Hmm. And that we shouldn't believe modernism if it tells us that those bad qualities are essential. We should say, you know what, I have a better idea. What if we take your good qualities, but we also mix in some of the good qualities you've thrown out from previous epochs, and we try something that puts all of these together. And, and what if rather than doing it like a recipe, what if we consider this, we use the phrase political science, right? You, everybody's heard the term political science. Do we actually conduct experiments? Yeah. Do we actually have different cities fundamentally trying different political systems and then documenting everything they do and publishing papers that are peer reviewed to see if, is it an accurate reflection of the differences between this one and that one? We don't do that. We are actually engaging in an empirical approach to how we organize the world, incremental, trying things out. Now, there are a lot of different ways forward that we could go that don't involve trying to lay out a utopian recipe, but that can involve letting the experiential side of life guide us more than it does. I think the pirate party has a good shot at doing political science. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, okay Donald, it's your. You, you. Hi, Donald. Well, I would, hi, hi, Rick. I was hesitant to speak. I know you always are. But know thyself has one, and it has the irony Delphi is Apollo shrine not Dionysus. Right. So, so we vilified Apollo. And yet, in Kenneth's, I think in, in Kenneth's uh, existentialism, as in other real existentialisms, knowing thyself, he asked you to come to judgments, to make comparisons, yes. to make choices yes. about what is truly beneficial to you. You can't hardly ask those questions about what's beneficial to somebody else all the time because you're not them, but you can ask them about yourself. And if you don't know yourself, you can't answer those questions. Yes. And so you can't really make much progress in studying Kenneth. Well, you study, he, he will also teach you how to know yourself if you're attentive but you have to go through that because right. without that knowledge existentialism of whatever flavor largely just runs aground right and that and, and I, I would i would say when we're talking all about fine there was a professor of mine in college in uh political philosophy that said the first thing we have to start with is that man is a herd animal. And that for the most part, we really like being together. <laughs> there are some right. case, well, this was this was Kenneth Smith, but it's a, it's a simple observation like that. And that is the foundation of politics, of family, of economics, yeah. of all of these things. Were, were yeah. we not a herd animal or for Stephen, we're, we're not really monkeys. We're more cows, Stephen. I just want you to know that. <laughs> okay. Mm. Thank you, Donald. You're yeah. insulting, you're insulting cows. <laughs> <laughs> we just wish we were cows. <laughs> yeah. You know, the thing about the thing about this, the skills that he wants to encourage us to develop as existentialist philosophers is that they, um, how do I put it? They involve taking responsibility for things we're used to ducking out of, right? We're used to the whole don't judge or somebody will judge you. We're used to discrimination as a bad word. Don't discriminate. Uh, we're used to 
Don't take responsibility for your opinion. Instead, um, quote a whole bunch of other people and show that, you know, because they said it, you really don't have any choice but to believe it. There's this way that we do academic writing and logic where we try to make it like it's not our fault. We reached the conclusions we did, so don't blame us. Uh, you see this uh, in government agencies. I'm closely associated with the Department of Veterans Affairs in the US, which is where the medical software I work on comes from. And the culture changed around the year 2000 to a culture in which everybody's eh, terrified of taking responsibility as a manager. So nobody will say, I promulgated this policy to make us do this thing. Instead, they, they form committees and the, out of the committees come reports and the reports just happen. Policy just sort of happens. And then the people in charge say, well, now that we have a new policy, we will all follow the policy. But what they don't ever do is say, if it goes wrong, blame me. I'm the one on the hook. The buck stops here. They're terrified of that. They don't, they don't want to take responsibility. So you see this in academic writing and you see it in pop culture as well. This idea that what we should all do is just really get along. We shouldn't be very judgy. We shouldn't, we shouldn't stick our neck out too far. But what Kenneth Smith says is, you know, the ancient Greek idea on this is that actually there's no substitute for developing a palate. You have to develop your sense of taste. Uh, some things you'll be able to logic your way through, but a lot of things you never will be able to logic your way through because it's going to require the experiential side of your mind to reach the conclusion. And that's not a matter of mathematical proof or logic or laws. It's a matter of discrimination and taste. And do you develop yourself as someone capable of making these judgments? And that requires practice, which means you've got to be willing to screw up a lot. You have to be willing to make bad judgments and then be criticized for them and then agree, oh yeah, I got that one wrong. Okay, let's see how I can do it better next time. Just like practicing anything else, you know, to develop this thing, you have to, um, you have to screw up publicly a lot. You know, Hegel has this criticism of Kant where he says, you know, Kant describes a perfect consciousness that's perfectly reasonable. And he describes a whole axiology that's based on if everybody was that way, then you could derive ethical propositions you know, as such. And Hegel says, but first of all, hardly anybody's that way. Even the most rational person has a, has a wide irrational component to them. And second of all, nobody's born out of the womb that way. So where is that perfect mind supposed to come from? What is this process of making mistakes to develop our reason? Kant has nothing to say about that. It's, he's just like, let's just skip the messy part. So he says, Kant is like those medieval peasants the, the scholastic, uh, you know, the, the scholastics who are imagining various parts of the world that they're uncomfortable with, like swimming. He says he's like he's like a medieval scholastic who doesn't want to get into the water until after he's mastered swimming, because only when he's at the peak of his form will he will he allow us how it might count as swimming. But the early stage, when you're embarrassing yourself, flapping around in the water and needing somebody else to keep you from drowning, Kant really doesn't want to talk about that because it's really uncomfortable and undignified, and. That's what it's like developing discrimination and taste to become an, an, an existential experiential judge of the world is, yeah, I mean, at first you're going to come out and, and you're going to fall all over yourself talking about, you know, oh, this, this really, you know, my, the best food I ever had is, you know, McDonald's. It's just, I really love their, their milkshake. And meanwhile, everybody around you is looking at you going, that's the best. And you're like, well, how would you know any better, right? You, you don't have the experience. You haven't developed your palate. You have to start somewhere and it's going to be somewhere embarrassing and it's going to take time, you know, and exposure to a lot of things before you're going to get good at this. But if you invest in it and you keep working at it, then someday you'll be at the point of saying, yeah, McDonald's shake is fine, but let me show you what I can do with my blender and some ice cream. Uh, you know, you'll, 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 you'll develop a better palate and you'll be able to make better judgments. One of the things about gnosis versus noesis is in medicine, you know, med students coming out of med school, the reason that they can't do brain surgery as well as somebody who's been doing it for decades is that they're all theory and no experience, right? They, it's all in their head. They have a noetic understanding of brain surgery. They know how it's supposed to go, but they haven't actually done it enough to know all the ways in which reality doesn't comply with the theory? What are all the different ways in which when you get in there, things aren't where you thought they were going to be? 
or you know this vein is in a different place or this artery has it has a different focus or the nerve bundles are organized differently it's only when you do this with a lot of experience over time that um, you've seen a broad enough variety of things and you've done it enough times you don't have to think about it anymore right your noesis doesn't have to be involved your experiential side of the brain is involved you're imitating your past successes and it frees up your noesis to be on the watch for anything unusual about the current case but otherwise you're able to just go through miming what you've done before what it means is that the experiential side of the mind has this holistic capacity to handle massive amounts of complexity in a very smooth way that the noetic side can't do at all because the noetic side has to follow each step in the reasoning and each each, you know, if you've got checklists of what could go wrong, it has to check everything off the list one by one because you haven't memorized it, you haven't learned it, it's not part of you yet. It's still something you think about. It's just not that efficient. It's powerful, but it's just not that efficient. It doesn't come close to the efficiency of the gnosic side of the mind. But when you put the two together, that's when you get the best results. You can see it in medicine, you can see it in other places. It's, it's if, if the modern world were to change its educational approaches to help people to develop the gnosic side of their mind, to match the noetic side, so that we could be firing on both cylinders, you know, who knows what we could turn the world into. Here endeth my little rant. Okay, Bryce, it's your turn again. Um, I'm just trying to, to find where to start digging in um and i'm i'm going and looking at his books and they're hard to find like how do where do i start what book do you recommend um yeah and how do you do you know how to even get yeah i'm just yeah leaving it there yeah so david roel who's on this call uh he he can get you access to the the books that kenneth smith has written it's good to start with otherwise and then webs because they're small bite-sized bits um, they have um, otherwise has one essay at the beginning. Webbs has two essays at the beginning and two essays at the end. But the bulk of it is these small parables, paradigms, and paradoxes. And each one is just meant to be a, an amuse-bouche, shall we say, uh, for philosophy. And at first, some of them you'll read them and you go, I don't know what he's talking about here. Because, you know, he's, he's, being, he's being expressive and right brain at you and you don't have the context. But, you know, some of them will, will speak to you even on the first reading. And as you go over it multiple times, you'll start to pick up connections from one parable to another where they start to bring each other into focus and you start to be able to see what he's going for. It's the most accessible way to get started with his work. And once you've done some of that, then you'd sort of be ready for the longer forms, um, which are more challenging. Okay, great. Thank you. And uh, David, I'm going to reach out to you. Actually, I'm on your website, so... I'll, I'll connect to you on the information that you provided there. Well, I'm wondering if we should call it a day. We've been going for... <laughs> yeah, three and a quarter hours now, right, David? <laughs> yep. And we could probably go on all night at this range. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I'll turn into a pumpkin soon. <laughs> oh, well, look, Rick, uh, thank you um, for presenting... Uh, Kenneth Smith to us and the discussion, of course. And thank for uh, David Rowell for um, facilitating the organizing of the connection with you. Yeah, so terrific. <laughs>